and sisters we have gathered here for the 26 dharma endowment lectures organized by the faculty of philosophy dharma endowment lectures is a lecture series which looks into possible integration of religion and philosophy in the contemporary times the topic of today's lecture is philosophy and the contemporary to welcome the distinguished speaker and the gathering, may I request Reverend Dr. Wilson Adartikaran CMI, the Dean Faculty of Philosophy. Dear and respected Professor Sundar Sarukai, Reverend Professor Kurian Kachapuli, President TV Kim, respected members of the staff, dear students, all the honorable online participants, good morning to one and all. I would like to start my words of welcome with a small funny story. When Jimmy, a nine-year-old boy, returned from his Sunday school classes, his mother asked him what he learned on that Sunday. Jimmy said, Well, mom, today our teacher told us about the Operation Red Sea. Operation Red Sea. She taught us how God sent Moses behind the enemy lines on a rescue mission to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. That is the Operation Red Sea. When Israelites were close to the Red Sea, God sent an SMS to Moses 
to ask his engineers to build a floating bridge with the Chinese technology. Within no time, the technicians and engineers prepared the computer draft of the bridge and collected the necessary parts from the Chinese bazaar in Cairo, assembled them and completed the bridge. Thus, the people of Israel had a narrow escape from the Egyptians. Then God used his walkie-talkie to radio headquarters for reinforcements. They sent bombers to delete the floating bridge, and thus the Egyptians who followed the Israelites perished in the Red Sea. Jimmy's mother, listening to the story, asked Jimmy, is that really what your teacher taught you? Well, no, not exactly, mom, replied Jimmy. But if I have told you exactly what the teacher taught, you will not understand and you won't be interested in it. That was the response of Jimmy. Jimmy's response reflects a great message. Any and every branch of knowledge demands innovation, inventiveness, and creativity. The old wine should be in the new wineskins. I hope the 26th Dharma Endowment Lectures this year will help us to reinterpret and revisit the classical text in the contemporary context. Now, let me come to my duty of extending a cordial welcome to all who are present here. We are indeed privileged to have the presence of Professor Sundar Sarukai as the speaker of the 26th Dharma and Domain Lectures. Professor Sarukai is not new to DVKM as he has already enlightened the DVK community with his scholarly talks earlier. Having his schooling and graduation at St. Joseph's Bangalore and MSc in Physics from IIT Chennai, Professor Sarukai had his PhD in physics from Purdue University, USA. He is the founder of the Barefoot Philosophers, an initiative to bring philosophy to the public. He is a visiting professor at the Center for Study, sorry, Center for Society and Policy, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. He is the author of many scholarly books and articles and editor of many national and international series of books. Sarukai was a professor of philosophy at the National Institute of Advanced Studies till 2019 and was the founder director of the Manipal Center for Philosophy and Humanities, where he set up an innovative interdisciplinary postgraduate program. He has been actively taking philosophy to different communities and places, conducting philosophy workshops for children and bringing philosophy to the public through his writings in the media. His forthcoming book, Philosophy for Children, will be published in English and other languages. I'm sure that, the, that during the next three and a half hours, Professor Sarukai will take us for an intellectual ride that will surely ignite our minds and challenge our vision of reality. In the name of all gathered here and all who are attending his talks online, may I now extend a most cordial welcome to Professor Sundar Sarukai. We are indeed privileged to have the gracious presence of Professor Dr. Kurian Kachapuli, President DVK, with this morning to inaugurate this 26th uh, Dharma Endowment Lectures. May I extend a most cordial welcome to Professor Kurian to the Dharma Endowment Lectures.
respected members of the staff, dear students, and all those who are attending these lectures online and offline, may I now extend a most cordial welcome to all of you. Welcoming you all once again, I remain, thank you. Thank you, dear father, for your warm words of welcome. The 26th Dharma Endowment Lectures is yet to be inaugurated. I'm gratefully privileged to welcome Reverend Dr. Korean Katsupoli CMI, the president of DVK for the inaugural address. Yes, of course, Dear Professor Wilson Ratukaran, Dean Faculty of Philosophy, Professor Sundar Sarukai, the source person of the day, honorable members of the staff, and my dear scholars and friends. At the very outset, may I congratulate the Dean, staff and students of the Faculty of Philosophy, DVK Bangalore, for organizing the 26th Dharma Endowment Lectures on Philosophy and Contemporary, delivered by Professor Sarukai, a reputed scholar and philosopher of science. The two key words under consideration today are philosophy and the contemporary which I may, with the risk of oversimplification, qualify as the knowledge society. From an evolutionary perspective, we can see several labels in the development of human societies, like agrarian society, industrial society, information society, and knowledge society. In the World Summit for the Information Society, that is WSIS, the two terms that captured the attention of all participants were information society and knowledge society with the respective variants. For sure, an information society differs from a knowledge society. The information society in general, I would say, only creates and disseminates the raw data. Indeed, the growth of ICT, information and communication technology like internet, digital technologies, mobile devices, etc., has significantly increased the world's capacity for creation of raw data and the speed at which it is produced. On the contrary, the Knowledge Society serves to transform information into resources that allow society to take effective action in the fields of, for example, education, training, employment, and access to life-sustaining resources for all members of the society. The term Knowledge Society. I know there are several definitions of the term knowledge society with the diverse nuances and implications. Perhaps one of the definitions that appealed to me mostly is knowledge society is understood as the ability that people have in the face of information to develop a reflective competence according to a particular time and space with the ability to establish connections with other knowledge and use it in their everyday lives. This is from Adriana Pelissari. The four important phrases we can call out from this definition are one, ability of the people. Two, a reflective competence. Three, ability to establish connections with other branches of knowledge and for use it in their 
everyday life. The exigency of philosophizing. A reality check would reveal that all is not well with the story of knowledge societies. It's often claimed that knowledge societies would bring progressive transformation in the society. But numerous examples such as system crash, redundant hardware, incessant innovation, early burnout, workplace and lifestyle stress, et cetera, are substantial indices of knowledge failure or systemic waste. Moreover, research on knowledge societies indicates that there is a great divide within and across the community, societies, and nations. Among the many challenges that the great divide contribute pertain to issues regarding economic resources, geography, age and gender, language, education, social and cultural backgrounds, etc. For example, in the political field, the contrast between the strong and the weak, in economics, the rich and the poor, in education, the literate and the illiterate, in the, in the cyber world, the haves and have nots, and so on. To these long list of challenges, Pope Francis, in his encyclical Fratelli Tutti, refers to the closed world enslaved with various plagues like the loss of historical consciousness, the throwaway culture, the stalled expansion of human rights, conflict and war, suspicion of immigrants, and the superficiality of digital connection that leads to loneliness, fear, insecurity, etc. Whether it is due to knowledge failure, systematic or systemic waste, or great divide, some sort of social fatalism looms large on the face of the people. And this alarming scenario of the society calls forth a new mode of philosophizing. According to Yoneji Masuda, the father of information technology, in the post-industrial information or knowledge societies, protection of values and not technologies, I repeat, protection of values and not technologies should be the driving force of the society. Some of these values presented in the report of the UNESCO for the development of an egalitarian and equitable society are cultural diversity, equal access to education, universal access to information, and freedom of choice and expression. Here comes the relevance and importance of philosophizing in the era of knowledge societies. In the advantages of knowledge societies, philosophy should become an inspiring discipline as well as everyday practice that can transform societies. By enabling us to discover the diversity of the intellectual currents in the contemporary world, philosophy stimulates intercultural dialogue. By awakening minds to the exercise of thinking and the recent confrontation of opinions, philosophy helps us to build a more tolerant, more respectful society. For UNESCO, it is also the way to unleash humanity's creative potential and generate new ideas. Pascal wrote, man, human, is but a reed, R -E -E -D, R-E-E-D, crossing, not the Red Sea, the Red Sea, but he is a thinking reed. All our dignity consists then in thought. Even today, philosophy is the bastion against the narrowing of opinions, a way to cultivate critical distance in the face of the onslaught of information and simplistic rhetoric that seek to set cultures against one another. There is an urgent need for philosophy. It does not give answers, but enables us 
to ask the right questions. Given the immense contribution of knowledge society to the enrichment of human experience, we are entitled today to ask two questions. One, can knowledge society enter into the field of philosophy in order to provide it with some concepts and principles and attempt to justify his claims? Number two, can philosophy intervene the domain of knowledge society, suggesting to it some problems, categories, and above all, values to be applied to the real world? We, the seekers of wisdom, are invited, given the alarming but alluring aspects of the knowledge society, to respond to these questions. Hope and pray that the lectures of Professor Sarukai an eminent scholar with expertise and experience will throw more light on these questions. May I conclude with a sharing of a philosophy student. While I once scorned philosophy, but I am now majoring in it, I have come to realize that philosophy provides the tools for us to become good thinkers which is perhaps the most important skill. Thank you very much. May God bless us. Thank you, dear father. May these lectures bring a spark in our young minds. With this, we conclude the inaugural session. I request Reverend Father Korean Katsbali and Reverend Father Wilson Adatagarin to occupy their seats with the audience. We begin our first lecture and I invite Reverend Dr. Gregory Malayal CMI onto the dais to moderate the session. Let us keenly listen to the first lecture on reading the past in the present. Over to you, Father Gregory. Dear professors and students, hearty welcome to the first session of the 26th Tharma Indomin, Indomin Lectures. Professor Saryukai now speaks on reading the past in the present. I request all the students to be attentive and alert throughout the sessions and uh, get ready with your questions. Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Father Gregory. Um, thank you, Reverend Professor Kodian and Reverend Professor Wilson for this kind invitation to deliver these talks as part of the Dharma and Roman lectures. It's always been a great pleasure to come and great honor to talk at DVK, which has been one of the most important philosophical institutions supporting philosophy in the country at a time when philosophy has had major, um, you know, I mean, everywhere philosophy is losing ground in different parts of the country. So it's a great pleasure and honor to be in the midst of all of you. It's also great to see so many students and faculty who are learning, thinking about, and writing philosophy who are present in this room. Again, at a time in which our uh, enrollments in philosophy has been drastically falling. It's very heartening to see the kind of interest that there is in this larger community. I decided to speak on the philosophy in the contemporary for various reasons. Part of it is to reflect the kinds of challenges and questions which have been raised about philosophy today, about the nature of philosophy, about the kind of philosophy that one needs to do. And there are very good reasons for these kinds of pressures and challenges on the very idea of philosophy. 
So I want. I thought it would be a great opportunity to reflect on some of the most important criticisms about philosophy. And as uh, uh, Reverend Father um, uh, Professor Kurian said, um, you know, one of the most important challenges comes from this knowledge information society, from the deeply entrenched growth of science and technology, which has now defined the character of our societies. But at the same time, our societies are rapidly changing from what they were before. So here are new challenges posed to philosophy in terms of asking, how does a philosophical attitude, how does this, the example, uh, which again Professor Kurian mentioned about the student, who said about the tools of philosophy, how do the tools of philosophy help us in understanding and negotiating with this world? And can philosophy do that task? Should we be asking philosophy to do that task? That is a very important question, which philosophy as a discipline faces today in amongst all, if you look at all the educational institutions and philosophy is present as a department, as a discipline which is taught to students, then the first question students want to know is, what is it that philosophy will do in terms of my existence today, in terms of my life today? like maybe the other disciplines too. And this is not to reduce philosophy to some kind of a use value, but actually to reflect upon what we are doing in the name of philosophy. And that's why I broke these three lectures um, into one, the idea of uh, the past and reading, uh, reading texts from the past, but we have to read them in today's time. And what does that imply? What does that mean? I want to begin with that and move on to the idea of the contemporary world in two set, uh, parts. One is the idea of contemporary science and technological world, because all of us here in this room, while we may, rule, when, while we may read texts which are 2,000 years old and my write commentaries on it, we are also using our smartphones for our very day-to-day -day living. What does it mean? Maybe there is no conflict. Maybe there is. Maybe these are parallel existence. But how do we think about it? People who use smartphones are too busy using smartphones to think about what smartphones do to our lives. And this is where philosophy contributes a great deal because it makes us pause and rethink and give us ways of thinking about the world we live in. So how does, what are the challenges which come from this extremely rapidly growing, mutating, changing world of science and and then I want to end with some reflections on the changing nature of societies, the way contemporary societies are evolving. And when I talk about societies, it is not an abstract set of nations and groups of people, but in terms of our basic human relationships with each other, relationships which occur in families, which occur in communities, which occur in groups of various kinds. What is that changing society? And what is the contemporary nature of the changing society? And how does philosophy as an idea respond? So, yes, it, it is a broad uh, canvas which I want to engage with today. But I am heartened by the fact that all of you are thinking about this philosophical point. So, I am going. I hope there will be some very interesting questions and discussions we could have. So, I'm going to keep it, um, you know, uh, at, at a provocative level in terms of certain kinds of questions we can do so that we can have a conversation between uh, you and us here, so that we, at the end of it, it gives you more questions and more points for reflection. And that's the spirit in which I want to do this as philosophy, as thinking together, okay? So that we work towards some ways of engaging and negotiating with these questions. So I begin with a very simple question. What does it mean to do philosophy? For many of us, who enter into, I mean, for many of the students who enter into philosophy departments, to do philosophy is to follow the syllabus of philosophy. You have certain texts, you have certain things that you have to read, maybe you have to write certain kinds of exams. So doing philosophy is to, as I said, go to class, get a syllabus, read something in philosophy and so on. Now that is for a large, you know, for a very large number of institutions, the so-called secularization of education in many of our so-called secular institutions like universities and colleges, 
and i'm emphasizing this word secular here because there is something about philosophy which challenges this idea that philosophy is just about going to class and reading a book and following a syllabus and that is what challenges it fundamentally is that in all traditions of philosophy whichever civilization which our culture you talk about wherever there is an idea of philosophy present there philosophy has always been practice and scholarship and the practice can come in different ways practice means in terms of the way one conducts oneself in terms of practices that we do in our day to day lives which are which complement what you read and what you think about and what you communicate and so on in many disciplines that we do in colleges today for example you walk into your class you sit in the classroom and at the end of you know from 9:30 to 4 or whatever you sit in the class and then you finish and go back home there is nothing within what you learn which is converted either as self transformational which doesn't have to transform who you are as a person which doesn't transform the society around you and it just becomes in the true sense of what uh, professor uh, korean was saying a true sense of just accumulating knowledge as one way of understanding knowledge society just collecting bits of knowledge and storing it within ourselves as against living on the basis of that knowledge and that's a very important uh, you know way of being in the world and most importantly it is philosophy which gives us a particular path towards understanding the nature of being in the world not as you know philosophical reflections like heidegger and so on but just as very simple question of your day to day everyday existence of just being in the world which in some sense is complementary to the positions you hold to the beliefs you have to the values you think you should live by that's something which is very important which distinguishes it very sharply from just a, a, another discipline which is going to produce knowledge about the world and from which you get empowered because of the knowledge about the world not because that knowledge of the world is converted into self transformation or to making meaningful lives around us so i want to come back to this question about whether philosophy today is able to do this and in our context today what does it actually mean to do philosophy the second question which follows from this is let's assume that the there the contemporary is a problem problem worthy of philosophical the contemporary is actually something which many philosophers have been writing about many artists write about it and much more i think the most dominant expression of contemporary comes in arts so for example there is a very famous um, extremely high quality dance movement arts center in bangalore which many of you will know about called the artakari center for movement arts they also have a very uh, you know an excellent uh, contemporary dance group and they call the the kind of tradition of dance which they perform is called contemporary dance and contemporary dance is a very important genre in um, arts and dance in modern uh, you know practices of dance you could have you have enormous amount of writings on the idea of contemporary art within art you can see within arts both performance arts and the visual arts you can see this question of the contemporary becomes extremely important and when um, uh, you know atakalari is performing contemporary dance the contemporary you may think oh what does contemporary dance could mean in the context is it you know is it new kinds of dance forms and so on no one of the first things you notice when you look at atakalari for example is how much they draw upon past traditions and they have a very interesting education program where the students who come to do contemporary dance degree will learn bharatanatyam as much as modern jazz dance and different types of dance forms and within the contemporary there is a very interesting engagement with the idea of tradition and with the idea of the past so contemporary is not just to say a denial of the past contemporary has within it an idea of something new but more than new 
it is something present and again you can see why for philosophy this is such a exciting concept to deal with because the idea of present being present has always been one of the most important and challenging concepts which on which philosophy has reflected a great deal has contributed a great deal of insight the present what is it to be in the present what is the present if you really want to see why uh, the concept of present is so philosophically rich the best example for you to think about is the uh, idea of theater again once again from arts where you know between philosophy and arts there have always been great engagement very vibrant conversation and again you can go back to the question of theater to understand a common question which is right from the earliest treatises on theater whether it is a natya shastra or the greek tragic tradition onwards to contemporary theater practices a simple question about theater is what does it mean to present the performance to perform in front of an audience how does theater differ from film for example how does a performance on a stage differ from a photograph for example the difference between a film and uh, a, a performance a stage performance which plays very much on the idea of being present where if there is a theater performance happening on the stage the actor is present before you whereas a film in which the actor was shot with some story and you're projecting it the film is present before you but not the actor right you're seeing the film at the moment of the present but the actor who is acted in it that film may have been taken one year back and you're watching it but theater evokes the idea of presence of the person in front of you but what does it mean what does presence contribute in fact if you look at some of the great actors in uh, on stage you know there may be very well trained actors but a director will say i don't want that actor because the actor does not have presence it's a quality of being there being present before you capturing your attention calling you out to me and saying i am here that's a philosophical concept and there is within the contemporary this deep engagement with this question of the now the present and the world and when you extend it to the world which we are talking about we are talking about the simple question of contemporary societies we are asking the question how does the world present itself to me now how does the society originate and engage and negotiate with me now in its presence now and that's a question as i said which which is deeply which can be deeply addressed which can with on which philosophy has the potential to engage with with much greater uh, felicity and uh, reflective capacity than almost any other discipline suppose somebody asks me well why can't science do it science after all creates the present that we are talking about science has created the contemporary world that we live in but the the science have the reflective capacity to reflect on the world it lives in or is it too busy creating the world of the contemporary that we are going to work with okay and when we do the next session on uh, philosophy and science i look at it a little more deeply to see uh, you know how we can do this so as i said i want to go back to this question um, of what uh, you know of reading the past and the present so i want to start with this question of what is therefore what is philosophizing and then if we accept that the contemporary is an important conceptual problem facing us how to make sense of the contemporary how to exist in the contemporary then we need to know how does philosophy matter to our understanding of contemporary and here is where as i said we go back to the question of what is it to do philosophy what is philosophy okay now one might say that the problem of understanding the contemporary philosophy is a problem of method and this is a much deeper question i'm sure many of your students of philosophy have reflected on this uh, about the question of 
when you are when somebody asks you go do philosophy what is the method by which i i know what it is to do some experiments let's say or somebody says go do physics i have a rough idea what i think i should do and this question has always been very important for many philosophers on what is this method of doing philosophy how does one go do philosophy it is also because philosophy itself is such a self reflective discipline it is not an accident that it is only in this discipline that you have very famous philosophers who will keep coming back and asking the question and writing books titled what is philosophy because we are always doing philosophy is always to be self reflective of what we are doing and how we are doing it and some of the most important reflections on philosophy come from these texts on what is philosophy and in contemporary times there is a particular challenge to philosophy in other words if i want to see how is philosophy seen today there is one major challenge and this i'm not going to go into scholarship to talk about the challenge we know that this is global but let me uh, share these points from years and decades of trying to you know work within this discipline and work with other disciplines and so on and uh, also the reason why uh, we don't have philosophy programs in the country people don't seem to support it uh, for many years you know almost all the public uh, universities had sort of removed philosophy largely or where they were you had no teachers and there's no funding there's no support and in recent times there has been some kind of uh, revival in private universities very expensive private universities where you pay a huge amount of money to do philosophy and other social science general arts programs and there has been some actually the push towards philosophy today is coming more from private universities uh, under the guise of what has been called liberal arts programs so whether it is azim prem university here kriya university um, also ashoka university flame many of them uh, where as i said the fees can range from 8 to 9 lakhs a year uh, for doing a bachelor's in arts or liberal arts and where you can major in philosophy for example um, you have some push to some push towards establishing philosophy departments in bangalore the if you uh, uh, so you know decade or so ago or many more the bangalore university closed its philosophy departments after many years of strife and fight within that and then uh, when the bangalore central university which started as bangalore central university which is now named as bangalore city university which is uh, headquartered in the central college campus under which many colleges in bangalore are affiliated to you know that under the affiliation system uh, they when they started it there's a i think a very uh, forward thinking visionary vice chancellor the first vice chancellor was professor jafet and uh, he had he was very keen on starting a philosophy department along with their other masters program so this was 3 years back and um, so he had approached me to do the philosophy thing so i was the chair of the studies of philosophy we developed a very interesting syllabus got some people to teach etc but uh, two years later the program is closed because there is so much resistance to having philosophy program they don't mind having other programs within bcu for example but to continue to have philosophy programs there is so much resistance from different departments different people in who have some say in our education system so this is something which we need to worry about and there is a reason for it and that is what i am calling as a contemporary challenge to philosophy that is a challenge to philosophy which comes from contemporary times one of the things which characterizes the contemporary time is a is a notion of immediacy is a notion of utilitarian in the sense of immediate uh, gratification so there is there is a lot in our contemporary society which is best captured i think the for me the i best model of what contemporary society is you know, the best image of it comes from maggi two minute noodles you know noodles are done in two minutes you just have you prepare an uh, a thing you know which is instant noodles you dump it in water you remove it in two minutes and you have what you have to eat as against creation of the noodles is a long process which takes time which takes effort which takes labor there is a 
the, the sense of the contemporary, which is so important for many of us today, is a sense of gratification and instant gratification. There's a lot of instantness to our lives. Look at what smartphones have done. Smartphones have brought instant noodles to your life in terms of instant films, instant music, instant photographs, instant everything. Earlier when I had to go to a film, I would have to go to, let's say, uh, Rex Theatre. There's a movie only at 3.30. And I had to go stand in queue with 100 others, get a ticket, go sit to the theatre and watch it. Watch it at a time which is chosen by the theatre owners, 3.30, not when I want it. Watch it with 100 other people, but maybe inconvenient for me, but whatever it is, I have to do that. And when there's a break, they decide the break and I have to get out at the break and come back in when they start. In other words, we were, as part of a world, we were part, not just of a social world, we realized that our gratification of desire was based on other people. Today, what have smartphones done? You feel like watching a movie now at 10.5. You just open your phone and watch it. You feel like watching it by yourself. You just turn it on and watch it. You want to get some food. Earlier you go sit in a restaurant and get. You have now converted it into a complete different kind of economy of this uh, Swiggy and others. You feel like eating lunch at 10.30 somewhere. Somebody will bring you food. You will be instant. The gratification, the instant gratification exemplified by the two-minute noodle has become so deep in our lives today that it defines, that it becomes a marker of the contemporary. And if you look at philosophy, it is everything that is not instant. And this is, you know, for how many years have I heard this point? And, you know, especially... Being in a campus, wherever, in an earlier institute where I was, which is part of also a larger science campus, there is a very strong distinction they, they make in their practices of science and practices of philosophy. And I've had small students, since we do uh, workshops for children and so on, I've also had young school kids tell me this, which is very interesting. They first say, you are still reading 2,000-year-old books. To them, Scientists don't understand it. You know, scientists don't understand. I mean, you could be a physicist, uh, Father Gregory here. And you know, I'm not saying him or uh, me, for example, when I give physics. We never studied Newton's original text. We didn't read Newton's Principia. We didn't read Einstein's Relativity Papers, the 1905 papers. We didn't read the original papers of quantum mechanics. Because for science, they are already old and past and gone. We have immediate latest papers published in one year back, two years back, as our main text which we engage with. There's a, there's a constant anxiety, constant being in the present, constant engagement with what is happening around you. And the past is a fundamental problem in that sense of the, for, for that sense of the for a sense of the contemporary, which is about instant gratification and, you know, this kind of question, things which I told you about, the past is a problem. And texts from the past are a bigger problem. So when people told me, oh, what is it? You just read all these old books written by all these people. It may not be 2,000, 1,000 years old or 500 years old or even 200 years old or even 50 years old. To them, it's like, why are you doing that? What is the point of actually engaging with these people? Does it mean? So the question they were asking, as not coming from philosophy, the question they were asking is, you know, if you think that these books are still relevant for you, then what you are saying is, knowledge has not changed much from what you had 2,000 years back till today. Or 1,000 years back from today. And that's the reason why in science, in its, in its anxiety of the contemporary, it is not, you know, it doesn't find the question of past relevant. And it is always, I mean, scientists are always, you know, uh, they found it very odd. They found it, you know, something on which they made fun of. 
about the fact that we keep going back to texts which are from a completely different era and but to me that question was a question which which i took as an opportunity to explain to them what philosophy texts do and why you would read these texts but that is a problem which remains again in these many of these workshops even from school children i have had this point little point that uh, this uh, point made which is that you know when they come to our workshops they enjoy philosophy a lot because we do a lot of questioning it's very open it's democratic you're always asking questions debating things and then at the end of it typically somebody will say is philosophy just about asking questions do you guys ever give an answer sure we can ask very deep questions we can keep asking deep questions but does philosophy have a capacity to produce answers and when people ask me that question what they are saying is this and again i want to go back to what uh, you know uh, professor kurian was saying and that's a very important part of the knowledge societies and knowledge economies the task of other disciplines including social science and the natural sciences seem to be the most important task is producing new knowledge is producing new accounts of the world is to produce new technologies of the world which allow us to do certain things in the world there's a constant production of the new every social theory forget about natural science technology social theory if you look at different uh, theories of society theories of democracy theories of equality theories of justice whatever that you want to think about they are in a constant production of the new look at the way this has been um, legitimized in our societies today through research journals and i'm sure all of us who are in the field have this great pressure of publishing research journals and so on you know in the sciences alone which includes a small subset of the social social sciences again there are nearly 7000 papers published every day 7000 papers published in established journals every day today we are in such a situation okay and remember what does it imply it implies that since each research paper has to produce a new idea which has not been produced before remember that's the fundamental definition of a research paper every research paper should have produced something new which had not been produced before 7000 papers are published every day which means at least minimum since the average acceptance of papers you know if you take all kinds of journals good journals may be about 3 to 5% to other journals may be 25 30% if you take you know let's say at least one quarter of the papers get published which means if 7000 papers are being published many more four times more at least of papers are being written by all of us thinking they are all new which means we are producing a modern contemporary knowledge production is just a production of the new a massive crazy pursuit of saying something new repeat to the extent that today you cannot get promotions you cannot get jobs if you don't show your research publications and at what level you know there are all these games which have become so much part of academic life so newness this production of the instant newness just like instant gratification instant newness you know you produce a paper in earlier times you would say oh you published a decent paper you can say okay another one year i have i can write something else today you look at especially at starting job positions and so on especially in you know, high powered uh, research institutions you have to produce five papers if you are in social sciences produce books whatever it is there's a constant pressure of the production of the new is there really so much knowledge being created in the contemporary world is there so much are we producing today we have reached the extent that there are um, you know the in various databases including uh, pubmed database it seems a paper one paper is uploaded every once in two one minute or yeah one um, once in a minute or once in two minutes across the world every 2 minutes a paper is being uploaded into this database of new 
research and scientific papers. To the extent today that scientists cannot follow all the newness which is being created in this contemporary knowledge society. And you know what they do? They have people who curate papers to them. You know, like you've heard again in arts, right? Curation. Somebody who organizes objects in a museum. They are a curator. Today, you have people who are organizing these millions of papers so that science, and then, then they'll tell people, scientists, read these 10 papers they work with, they deal with this, those are the 10 papers they do. Since the scientists don't have time to read million papers, you need somebody else to do the job of telling them what they should read, what they shouldn't read. Are we producing that much knowledge? Is all that knowledge significant, necessary? This is a very important question of the contemporary society that we have to think about, particularly the contemporary academic society, the knowledge scholarship society. But you can see now why this has, this, this culture of knowledge production, of contemporary knowledge production, poses a great challenge to philosophy. Because one, this contemporary knowledge production is producing enormous amount at, at, at the present, the notion of the contemporary. <coughs> and two, the question of newness, constantly saying something different. And here we have philosophy, here we have a discipline, which, is, which, which ironically is the mother discipline of all the disciplines that we have. A very old mother who is not keeping up with the kinds of knowledge production of the contemporary, who, go, who in going back to the past makes other people ask the question, why does the past matter to you? Why do these past texts matter to you so much? What new things are you producing in philosophy? So remember that the past and the old is not just the question about the past and the world. They are asking the question, what new things is philosophy producing? That's the question. In a world of instant gratification and two-minute noodles, where is the role of philosophy in the production of the new? What kind of new things have we said about the world over the last 1,500, 2,000 years? If I'm going to talk about text, let's say I'm talking about the basic question of ontology, metaphysics, and epistemology, which have already been formulated, let's say, in the, the Indian philosophy traditions or the Greek traditions, then what, are, what is it that we have done over these 2,000 years that when I'm talking to my students today and the students say, okay, we get it, so what is it that you have produced in the new, what is my response to it? I'm, I'm only posing this as a challenge and I'll, you know, over the course of today, I want to tell you why, what philosophy does and the importance of doing philosophy, especially in a world of instant newness instant gratification which characterizes the contemporary. But to do that, we have to take this criticism seriously. So one way to answer this is to say, the task of philosophy is not this mad production of the new, unthinking production of the new, but it is something else. And the, 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 and the past plays a very important role in it, and therefore the question of texts play a very important role. The second specific point, um, scholarship. Again, scholarship is so essential, again, linked to particular practices of philosophy. Again, let me use a contrast of natural science. Um, the question of scholarship is a big divide between contemporary practices of science and contemporary practices of philosophy. And there have been various kinds of debates around this. But typically what, what it means is this. When I write a philosophical text, let's say a paper publication or a book, I draw upon various sources. I draw upon various authors. I draw upon various texts. I quote, you know, 100 people in the text that I write. I point out this person said this, that person said it, but I'm going to try and do this, etc., etc. The text is heavy with quotations and scholarly citations connections, intertextual connections with the large tradition into which the text belongs to. That's the standard practice, as I'm sure all of you do, in the text that you study. And then you take, and then these are verbose texts. These are big, fat texts. Uh, many people find it difficult to read them as texts. They 
philosophy, why are they written, why is philosophy written in that way, so difficult to read, etc. And then you look at the contrast to contemporary productions of disciplines like in the natural sciences. Natural sciences, very few people write research books. They may, they may write textbooks. They don't write research books like we do, let's say, in philosophy. And if you look at their papers, their papers will be very short and to the point. Today, there are so many rules on how, what the size of papers should be, etc. in science. It, is, it just makes a point. It gives certain data, whatever else, some argument. So that's it. Citation is secondary in the sense, citation is important if you are referring to a few papers, but scholarship is completely frowned upon. You can take some of the most important published papers which may have won the Nobel Prize or which may have had great impact on the discipline. You will rarely see quotations of other scientists, quotation of what somebody said, and definitely no quotation of the founding fathers like including Newton, Einstein, etc. Very little, if at all. And in the, if it is not in a context, if it is of just contemporary, you know, like physics, uh, chemistry, biology, etc., you will not find any of these. There is nothing called the founding father syndrome present in these contemporary practices of education, of uh, research production, knowledge production. Scholarship is a very deeply important question for philosophy. And that's connected to the fact that it's in relationship to the past. And that the source of philosophy continues to be the seminal text from the past. Because of which, there is this notion of scholarship which comes because you're always making your indebtedness to somebody else. And say, they may have said it this way, I'm saying it's slightly different. But there is also a question of an epistemic virtue. There's actually a principle of virtue which is present. That I want to acknowledge that others may have said something it's a very important principle of saying, I'm not the guy who is claiming that this is all my own. There is very little that's my own idea, my new idea. It comes from an indebtedness to others. Everybody else, somebody has done something similar or maybe something related, and I'm making an acknowledgement of that. So in that sense, it's a very important value, and that value has no place in science, where you don't have to keep making your acknowledgement of, like you would make to Plato or Aristotle, Western tradition, you don't have to keep making those, um, you know, acknowledgement to Newton, Einstein, Feynman, and others, because you are doing something in the content, in the production of this particular kind of new. So, scholarship question is a. It's also a question which, by the way, uh, in social sciences, it's the the only place where you see in contemporary practices of disciplines where this philosophical method and philosophical practice of scholarship is present is in many texts and social sciences. To the extent that the great fight between natural science text and social science text uh, were, revolves around the fact that, you know, we spend most of the uh, words in a page and most of the words in a research paper or a book citing others or giving references to other people rather than saying what you want to say. So that's a very, uh, you know, as I said, completely different kinds of questions. There is a more foundational critique of philosophy's dependence on texts. And that again has been voiced uh, through modernity in various ways. But it's an important critique which is also voiced in contemporary times, uh, again, in many, many different forums. And that is the fact that from the way they understand it, the people outside philosophy understand it, they think that we, when we do philosophy, we are too much in texts and words. And to them, the question is, where is the real world in your immersion of the texts and words? And this was a very important critique of Greek thought, by the way, of Aristotle and Plato in different contexts. Uh, as I said, you know, there is a very important component of uh, both Indian thought and Greek or African, Asian African philosophical traditions uh, and the Greek traditions. Some would argue that the Greek traditions actually belong to that particular Asian African tradition, uh, which is that there was a practice which was always uh, integral to philosophical thinking. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'll conclude this first part in five minutes and we'll continue it since, since we have three sessions on this. So, uh, 
there is a very famous uh, point about um, a critique of Aristotelian understanding of, uh, I think it is the context of a number of teeth that the woman had, etc. And saying, what he was saying was absurd, because all he had to do was to open a woman's uh, mouth and see how much teeth she had, instead of trying to uh, give, um, instead of giving a, an answer which was uh, patently wrong. In other words, the critique of philosophy which, by the way, leads to the development of modern science and the breakup away from science to philosophy comes from the fact that an immersion into texts, deep immersion into texts with uh, sufficient uh, not paying attention to the outward world, to the empirical domain, leads to contradictions, leads to various kinds of fallacies. So one of the critiques of philosophy was about what is your engagement with the world? You are deeply immersed in the world. You know, philosophers have used all kinds of traditions of learning how to look at the world, how to understand the sentence. You had a whole tradition called hermeneutics, which is very deeply related, as I'm sure all of you have studied, to the biblical tradition. Um, and late in, in, for example, in the Indian philosophical tradition, you have a very same interpretative uh, school, the Mimam Sikhas, which are doing the interpretative tradition of Vedas, for example. These are very important contributions by philosophers in asking questions about what does a word mean, how do I make the, how do I understand the meaning of a word by breaking it up into small parts and so on. But still, is it that we are too absorbed within a text that we forget to understand what the empirical world is teaching us about what should be in the texts? In other words, the question they were asking is, can philosophy be empirical? Because remember that the idea of the sciences comes from the movement of just sitting in a room and armchair thinking, reflective thinking, into an empirical mode of thinking. And if we think that, you know, philosophy can be empirical, I mean, whether it can be empirical or not can be debated, but we should also remember that there are many programs in the world now in which empirical philosophy experimental philosophy has become part of their philosophical practices and courses. So there are people now who have started doing experimental philosophy, empirical philosophy of different kinds. Uh, very interesting. I don't, I don't think, you know, I, I mean, I don't think, um, I don't pay too much attention to it in the sense. Um, there has always been, a, in my view, uh, once you understand philosophy as, a, as an amalgamation of both practice and reflection, that aspect of the empirical is already there, but we did um, enter into this particular uh, problem. So, I'm going to stop here by just saying, making this point, and I just pick it up to lead on to my question of uh, sciences, that it is not just a matter of taking an ancient text and reading it. Because we have to ask the question, what do we do when we read these texts? How do we read these texts? And that's not just a matter of hermeneutics alone to say how to read the text. Because, and this is the last point I make, and this is, the, I think, a crucial point. The text which we read is now a contemporary object. It is no longer a text which was written 2,000 years back. That is, you, if you take a text, okay, let's say you take uh, Plato, and you're reading a Plato now, we have to recognize that it may look like as if it's the same text, leave the question of you know, whether the text was all the words are the same, etc. We have a text, I place it before me, but that text which I read now is not the text which Plato wrote. This text is a contemporary object. It comes to my presence as a contemporary object. In other words, a simplest way to understand it is the meanings of those words are already contemporary. The context in which those words arise are contemporary. They are not the context in which Plato wrote that book. So what does it mean for you to read an old, an, uh, a text, a very ancient historical text in the contemporary time? Okay, I'll stop here for you to think about this and then I'll say how that leads to this question of uh, contemporary science and hypothesis. Thank you, Professor. Uh, we discussed the following uh, points. What we are doing in the name of philosophy is contemporary nature. 
philosophy as thinking together then challenges concept of the present and past and role of philosophy in the era of instant gratification indeed it was an enriching session now this is a time for interaction Thank you, Professor Sundar, for your great session. I want to ask one question. It's a, it's a question. It's not a question. Actually, yesterday night I was uh, watching the video of NASA, and we are in Mars with the Perseverance, and uh, Elon Musk, one of the uh, one of the leading person who is trying to civilize in Mars, and I'm thinking. i was just reading a philosophy book of uh, 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 arne nees on eco philosophy and during that time this um, the journey of nasa and that video is also with me so what happened is that i entrusted my full time for viewing this video and arne nees this philosophy text seems to be irrelevant and elon musk is saying maybe next 100 years we will do this philosophy symposium in mars and we will begin a new philosophy in martian philosophy and so i have a craze to this new empirical reality and what is the philosophy behind this craze what is the philosophy behind this this search for newness what do you think about that thank you brother we will take two more questions and professor will respond all the questions together thank you sir for your thought provoking session it was really a matter of joy to listen to you because for the first time i listening to a philosopher who is not a priest as you mentioned i started my philosophy after doing physics bsc then i felt so i should have studied philosophy first then physics because the history of science that part of it is not there in the curriculum i have studied about why maybe pythagoras theorem scoring equations einstein newton leibniz but their life history how they came to that idea nothing is mentioned in the book so i would i feel that in the curriculum also at least some introduction about the philosophers about the scientists if it is given it will be useful for the students i feel what's your opinion about that thank you father arogy sami one more question father jos Uh, we do refer to the original text in my class i kind of insist that you should read the original text but all these original texts were a serious critique to the contemporary at that time socrates plato aristotle a reinterpretation of it by augustine and aquinas and a critique of that by uh, in the modern western philosophy descartes hume kant hegel and in the contemporary so though we philosophers immerse ourselves who comes out as significant is who are providing a critique a creative vision so the newness is not totally absent it's only that when we look at the new we do not forget our roots where do we come and always we are looking as human beings there are certain certain fundamental constancy in the midst of all the change in our life so I, i consider the critique dimension is very important in philosophy second one a related question you may refer we are more bothered about the time factor what about the space the context of the text 
not just the temporal context, but the spatial context. If you are referring it, it's only a side question. Thank you, Father. Yes, you would permit uh, one more question. Father Kuria. Uh, thank you, Professor Sarukai. In your presentation, you try to portray the contemporary in terms of number one, instant gratification, second, instant newness. Now, my humble take from your talk, what could be more new than thoughts, which is provided or facilitated by philosophy? If thoughts are new, those who are looking for instant gratification will somehow be answered by instant new? Because that's our curiosity. And curiosity, if they are satisfied, philosophy would satisfy. So if philosophy, my, my, my proposition will be like this. If philosophy can provide instant new, which in turn will instant gratification. Therefore, philosophy is not irrelevant, even in contemporary. Thank you. A very rich set of questions allows me to fill up a couple of blanks in what I was saying. Very quick. I think there are three of them which are really about the newness idea. And uh, there's one about science. I'll answer the science first because the other three are all about the newness. Um, as you pointed out, uh, you know, science talks about the content of their descriptions, like what science is saying, rather than talking about uh, people, their life stories. How did they come up with that? Uh, you know, the history and the philosophy of their ideas. Uh, you are very right. And I think, in fact, uh, in my own work on science education, science education as an educationist who are working on this, there's a big community in India which looks at this. Uh, we have been pushing for uh, rewriting science texts as uh, texts which are produced by human creativity, human whatever, uh, human fallible, fo it's human um, all rights and wrongs, you know. Many ideas in science have come because people have made mistakes, not because there was a particular method for reaching the answer. There have been very important contexts. In the Indian context, for example, we have been pointing, trying to get texts to incorporate the origin of ideas in, uh, in the Indian context. For example, we know for, for, for nearly uh, two million are back, some of the greatest work in the world in science technology comes from this Indian subcontinent which for example, in things like um, um, in uh, metallurgy, the first examples of very high quality steel of, high co of uh, zinc making processes all occurred in this region. And what is very important is the people who produce that knowledge and technology were people who are not the dominant in society. They were blacksmiths. They were people who were belong to different caste groups in society, different labor practices in society. And what we have produced as, for example, high science today is something which seems to have privileged certain class and caste groups. So these are, these are very important points to understand how that, um, you know, the kinds of innovative science happened through a democratic process within society, not through a non-egalitarian hierarchies within society. So th those are extremely important learning about the nature of scientific knowledge. So this is a project which is going, I hope, there will be some um, thing out of it. Um, the, the next three are very interesting questions about newness. And I think the first one about uh, the mass and the newness, the, I think, uh, you know, very quick answer to that is the philosophy behind new. I mean, it's only philosophy which can reflect on concepts in ways which no other discipline can reflect upon. Even philosophy of science, as we'll see in the next session, some of the most fundamental scientific concepts have been understood and illuminated by philosophical thinking, not by scientific practice. So it is not a surprise that if you look at the concept of new, what does new mean and what does contemporary mean? It's philosophers who have been reflecting a lot about it. Okay, um, there are, but there's, it's always in a constant tension with practices of science or with practices of this instant transformation of knowledge into, um, you know, specific technologies, for example, because the, the the function of philosophy is not to produce technologies. We don't produce technologies like science would do. Scientific knowledge is deeply indebted to the conversion of knowledge into something else. And that's why I keep coming back to the point. Philosophy has a self-transformative role. The knowledge of philosophy has to matter to the way we live. If that is the technology of philosophy, that is how we make a difference. 
then through the ways by we practice in our life, the way we live our lives. And that has been sort of uh, lost in some various ways. So this question of newness, I totally agree. And there are a lot of very interesting work on, uh, you know, the question of uh, colonizing the, um, the solar system, etc., the colonizing the universe and the newness. Um, Father Joseph's point is uh, also a very interesting point, I think very important point about how, um, you know, we are, there are, every philosophical tradition has always been a critical tradition, which reflects a contemporary of that time. In fact, as we know, he gave many examples from Western thought. We know, for example, in Indian thought, also for example, Indian philosophical traditions, there was a very established method with a summary of, uh, of the traditional school of that particular school and the opponent's position. Every philosophical text has to state the opponent's position before stating something. And what is very important is we make a big mistake when we reduce uh, Indian philosophical tradition to just some text because what distinguishes Indian philosophical tradition is constant criticism and the commentary tradition. Every commentator who comes from within the same tradition disagrees with the original text and makes their own modification. And as we saw, that's very much true of many of the examples which Father Joe said within the Western, the Greek and the European tradition. So philosophy is constantly, and I totally agree with him, the task of philosophy is criticism in a very, criticism itself becomes a concept which philosophers think about, you know, so the notions of critique to criticism. So that is the fundamental part. The point, the, the people who are criticizing our practice of philosophy today, what they are saying is, Doing philosophy today in India or in many of the parts of the world has been reduced to just a hermeneutic reading of text rather than, so what they're asking is, how do we as philosophy students behave like Plato, Aristotle, Socrates and Kant and Hume? That is, how do we use the learning that we have in order to produce a critical discourse of the society, of the text that we live in? That is the question. So today, as we know, in many cases, uh, uh, this is the charge against what some people would say is happening in philosophy is that we reproduce texts. We say that uh, Plato said this, Nyaya said that, or the Buddha said that, and so on. And we forget the fact that philosophy in its essential practice is a critical enterprise, which is doing this reflective thinking of the contemporary within. So this is a much larger question of challenge to what we uh, philosophy is there. But I, I think that's a very important point that you raised. And the, also the very important point that you made about the temporal dimension is very obvious in the history of philosophy. But the spatial dimension is to the, the social dimension. That is, how does the context, where does the location of philosophy matter? Again, a very fascinating point of discussion. Um, and how does the location actually matter within this context? There have been many different interpretations, I mean, different ways of things we can read it, that concepts get uh, meanings only in certain contexts, and the context in which they are present are different, then they are very different. And uh, this, this actually opens up a lot. Let me see over the next two sessions if I can directly give some examples of that. And uh, for, for Father Kurian's uh, defense of philosophy as newness, I totally uh, you know, agree. But what I was trying to say is that when people criticize the uh, you know, when they're asking this question, what is what are you doing as in philosophy, etc.? The point, the thing they point out to is this constant problem of newness. Now, for them, as I said, newness itself is defined in different dimensions. Newness of um, not just a, a new object is new for them. You know, for example, a new relation is new for them. A new part of an object which they create is new for them. And there are various kinds of categorization of the new that we can do. Um, Many of the newness, there is only one component of it, which is new thoughts, right? And that is very important part of it. And it's also very privileged, for example, in both social science and scientific theorizing. But um, the, the, and, and the, the anxiety for publication, as I said, the number of journals which publish in the sciences oh, is thousands of times more than that of social, the humanities and so, uh, philosophy journals. The speed by which uh, science journals publish, the newness, because the new has to be new. If it's too old, they won't publish it. I mean, it doesn't make sense. So newness in science publication means there are so many systems for making sure your results are out within one week, two weeks, one month maximum. There are different types of journals which will publish what you write within a month. Now, because they find that itself is too late, because it's not capturing the new, 
there are uh, e archives archives deposits where people can put their papers in so immediately next day people can read what they have written that anxiety about the newness there philosophy we send a paper there are some journals which will reply back after one year and they'll publish it after two years and they're saying look there's no hurry you know i mean at some level it does get uh, to be a bit of a you we think we have written something we want to share it and so on but that is reflected in our practice and i think when people look at philosophy they tend to ask you know they tend to ask this they don't see the you know the characteristic of newness and that's why when i'm doing public philosophy like when i do for philosophy children etc we keep going back to the fact how philosophy it may use old tools it may use vocabulary which may seem quote unquote unquote old but it gives you new insights into the world we live in now and i'll give you examples in the next two sessions to illustrate this particular point of how philosophy recaptures the new with the old and i think that was very well put by um, father wilson when he said old wine in new bottle that analogy when you use you find that yes we do use we do use old texts we do use conceptual structures from the past but they can illuminate the contemporary in very new ways and that is a very important task which philosophy does and i'll just try and show you to some examples how that has been done thank you professor we will continue the sessions after a tea break now i invite mc for announcements thank you father gregory for moderating the session it is time for tea break Tea will be provided for all priests and guests in the foyer. For the students, tea will be provided at the entrance of the auditorium. Kindly follow the COVID protocols, especially avoid the crowding and follow safe social distancing. Next session will resume at exactly 11 a.m.
Attention, please. Kindly occupy your seats so that we may begin the session in time. So good morning. So this is with regard to the convocation. The 44th con convocation will be on Wednesday. That means uh, 24th February. So this year we are not inviting all the students for the convocation because of this COVID-19 pandemic. But the following batches from philosophy, they are supposed to be here. So I am I'm going to read out the batches. Uh, the students who are supposed to be here. So those who are supposed to be here, uh, their attendance will be taken. So please listen carefully. Third year BPH, second year MA in philosophy, second year diploma in philosophy, certificate in philosophy, and first year and second year LPH students. And also all the students who are residing at Athena, Kesh, and in DVK Research Center. So only the first years are exempted. Okay, not all the first years. So I read again, second year BPH, second MA philosophy, second year diploma in philosophy, 
certificate in philosophy and first year and second year LPH students. And also all the students of DVK hostels, that is Athena, Kesh, and DVK Research Center. And all these batches, they are supposed to be here uh, for the convocation program and their attendance will be marked. So please come and join the program on Wednesday. Other batches, what about the other batches? Rest of the DBK students are requested to participate the convocation program online. So we will send the link. So I hope it is clear now. Okay, thank you. So one more category I missed from the list, that is all the PhD and the THD students. Okay, all the PhD students also from philosophy faculty. They're also supposed to be here. So all the students residing Kesh, Athena, and DBK Research Center and other batches. Welcome back. Let's now move on to the second lecture. I invite the speaker on the dice. Also, I invite Reverend Dr. Jojo Parikatal CMI to the dice to moderate the following two sessions. The topic of this lecture is philosophy in contemporary science and technologies. Over to you, Father Jojo. So welcome back to this second session. Often it is said the scholars of philosophy should have two eyes. One, to look back to the past where the philosophy developed and the other, to look to the present where philosophy becomes a reality here and now. And although we are aware of this golden rule, Often we know what is happening in our classroom. Most of the times in general, we have it and it's always to look to the past. But today, through this endowment lectures, Professor Sunnar Sarukai is inviting all of us how to look to the present. And in this second session, we are uh, going to deal with the topic philosophy and contem contemporary science and technologies. We know science and philosophy, they are friends, fellow seekers of truth. So dear sir, we are eagerly looking to you to get enlightened on this topic. Thank you. Um, yeah, the last point I want to make to lead us to this topic now of uh, contemporary science and technologies is to um, recognize how the past functions, why the, how the past text function in our understanding of the contemporary world. If you look at, so if you really look at how we use philosophy, so when I, I wrote this book called Indian Philosophy and Philosophy of Science, um, because I wanted to look at how you look at, to show a model of how you could use a different philosophical tradition to look at contemporary philosophy of science, since uh, a large number of people within philosophy of science, uh, almost all that, all the philosophy that we use within philosophy of science is uh, Greek and European thought. So as a, as a form of exercise to say how there are different philosophical traditions and we need to find ways to illuminate the activity of science by using different traditions, I looked at the logical tradition with different Indian philosophical schools, with schools such as um, Nyaya, which is the dominant uh, so-called rational logical school, the Buddhists, the Jainas, etc. Now, the reason why that is possible is because we know that philosophy is a foundational discipline upon, around which many other disciplines have come. Even the question of science as a discipline comes much later uh, from philosophy, as an offshoot, as a breakaway from philosophy, in some sense. So, 
fundamental topics which philosophy talks about are still relevant today. They may have been talked about in the past, but the fundamental topics are still relevant. So one example you could look at is logic. Logic is a very good example because I'm sure as philosophy students, you've all studied uh, syllogisms, Aristotelian logic, and so on. And if you do Indian philosophical systems, every Indian school, uh, of, which is mapped in whatever way they want to do it, ha has uh, inference. Anumana has a central category. So the analysis of inference, which is what logic is largely understood as, is very much a part of all philosophical traditions. And what does analysis of inference mean? That we are trying to understand why you conclude something given something else. So I look at, for example, the dark clouds and I conclude it's going to rain. And all that the idea of logic and inferences is, how valid is my conclusion? And science does this extensive, science often is associated with the idea of logic and, and so on. But the, the crucial point we recognize is this, that the basic analysis of inference, whether as Aristotelian syllogisms or as the Buddhist model or the Nyaya model, are still very deeply relevant to us today because they're still asking the question, how do you infer, to use a famous Indian logic example, how do you infer that there is fire from seeing smoke? And that could have been done 1,000 years back, but nothing has changed the fact over these 2,000 years that when you see smoke, you shout fire. You think there is fire there. So one could say that neither the temporal or spatial context matters to this analysis of natural phenomena because when Galileo is talking about the origin of modern science through Galileo when he's analyzing how a stone rolls down or how a stone falls when dropped, trying to understand the nature of motion, it's not different from our experience today. In other words, the natural world has been far more constant than perhaps the social world. And we'll come to the social world Session. That is a constancy of nature. 2000 years is nothing for nature. So I'm giving a rebuttal from our side now to all this criticism of the philosophy reflecting on the past. In the long history of millions of years of natural evolution, 2000 years of human thought on natural processes is nothing. And there are very few natural processes which have changed in these 2000 years. And therefore, any philosophical analysis of nature is still very relevant to us today because it shows us how we thought about nature. So remember that the question of philosophy and nature is so deeply linked that Newton, the founder of classical physics, is called, was called in his time as a natural philosopher, not a physicist, not a scientist. The word scientist is coined only as late as 18. There's no word called scientist which somehow brings all the people working on science together till the 19th century. Newton was called a natural philosopher. He is a philosopher studying nature, if you like. And there is very little that has changed in nature. And therefore, to draw upon texts which have understood about the nature of nature, trying to understand and describe and explain why nature works, is meaningful. But doesn't mean the philosophers got it right. One of the best examples of philosophers who got it completely wrong and therefore you needed something called natural science to happen is Aristotle. One of the greatest philosophers, somebody whom we should all read, of course, but also somebody who made fundamental mistakes about the nature of motion, about the belief that there are only finite universe and there is nothing called empty space and so on. And as historians of science point out, it is the overthrow of fundamental Aristotelian doctrines, such as the ones I mentioned now, which led to the origin of modern science. If you did not overthrow the, and you couldn't overthrow Aristotle because of this, you know, very strong presence within the field, and you, you know, it's like uh, saying Einstein is wrong. So you needed a series of public experimental demonstration by scientists for the famous example of showing the vacuum the two horse thing, you know, pulling and all that thing, which I'm sure you've seen in school. You needed that to be able to overthrow the hold of Aristotelian thought. And as Bacon and others who talk about the early modern science point out, you had to break the methods of philosophical thinking, particularly 
the version of scholarship and a different version of scholasticism, not necessarily the medieval scholasticism which tried to talk about reason and faith, uh, in order to be able to create what is called modern science. So while that may be the case, you cannot dispute the fact that Aristotle was the first scientist in you, if you like, Aristotle, Plato and Socrates and others, in their forms of inquiry. And similarly, if you come to the uh, Nyaya tradition, they would be the first, in my view, in my own argument I've written elsewhere, on how uh, they, they, they understand the processes of the relationship between logic and the empirical world, and which to me is the fundamental dimension of science. That is, on the one hand, you have certain forms of thinking. If you like, we can use one limited definition of logic as laws of human thought, L-A-W-S, laws of how the rules by which we think. And on the other, you had natural phenomena. And we know that in philosophy, again, this very important distinction between these two was voiced in very different ways, actual and the possible, the necessary, and the of, you know, various mobile terms around it and so on. And for philosophers, that was a very important distinction. There is something contingent about the world, which is not there in other kinds of uh, rational thinking or, or certain processes of thinking certain syllogistic conclusions, for example. Whereas all natural facts, natural truths about the natural world are contingent. In other words, they are not necessary. It happens to be the case only on earth. So for example, even a truth such as a stone when dropped is going to fall to the ground is contingent. There's nothing necessary about it. It's not a necessary truth. It is a truth on earth. But you could imagine like going to Mars, you discover another planet where you drop a stone, it goes up because it's repelled and not attracted. And you needed to make a distinction between the contingent and the necessary. And that's what philosophy did. And nothing has changed from the time, whether from the Aristotelian and the Greek tradition or the Indian traditions, nothing is different from these simple questions. How do I infer smoke, fire from smoke? How do I distinguish empirical facts versus uh, necessary facts, necessary truths versus empirical truths? Those remain the same. And those structures are the foundational structures of the world. And therefore, it is not that much of a surprise for those who try and understand contemporary only in terms of a particular kind of present, miss the fact that the foundational aspects of thinking have already been set out in the philosophical texts. And therefore, it makes very good sense to be able to draw upon the deep thinking about, uh, you know, how they thought about these questions. I want to again make a distinction. When I talk about texts, I think it's extremely important. This I do it as a practice and with my students and others in our programs also, that reading a text for me is not about discovering the content of the text. Of course, every philosopher is going to say many things. When I'm reading it, the content is not as important to me. I want to know how that author is thinking, how the author has come to that conclusion. Because even if the conclusion is wrong, the method is still useful for us. Why would I make a distinction between empirical facts, the contingency of the empirical facts, versus uh, you know the necessity of logical tools? That's a method. It is telling you, how to think about phenomena in the world, how to think about my life, how to think about society. The conclusion that Aristotle may have come may be wrong, is wrong on many counts, including the fact that, you know, the ways in which he understands motion or natural motion is also wrong, which Galileo had to overthrow. But that doesn't matter because philosophy is not about concluding end statements. It's not a PowerPoint. That's why we cannot do PowerPoints in philosophy. Generally. Right now with these online talks, I find I only do PowerPoint because it's much easier than speaking to a computer. But now that we are all together, present with each other, then there are very different ways of engaging with language. And there's something very important which philosophy does is in terms of trying to show you structures of thinking about the world, structures of analyzing that remain, I think, as relevant today as it was for the early philosophers. 
And so if you look at philosophical text, not to give you some, you know, truths which are unchanged, but rather look at them as processes of thinking, knowing what kind of questions to ask, and so on, you find that they are old philosophical texts become very contemporary. So if you look at, for example, as I said, inference is a very good example, and look at language. You know, you had, of course, again, uh, in the Indian tradition, you had Pandi and then the grammarians. Uh, particularly for language, the Indian philosophical tradition was very strong for various reasons, you know, very important traditions and so on. But if you look at some of the basic questions which they are asking, they are, what is the question they are asking? How does a word get its meaning from? What is the relationship between the word and the meaning associated with that word? Where is the connection? So if I say cow and I point to a cow, and if somebody asks, what does the word, the sound cow mean, and you point to your cow, you know, there's this wonderful debate among these different philosophical schools on only this single point, right? So I hear the word sound cow, and they ask, what is it? I say, the meaning of the cow, I point to a cow. Now, does it mean that the meaning is the object which the sound stands for? And then there is a, even in that, it's very, there are higher levels of question. When I point to a cow, and I hear the word cow, I'm associating the word cow with object, but when I may be pointing at the color of the cow, I may be pointing at the udder of the cow, I mean, pointing to a particular shape or the horns of the cow. So what is this association between a sound I make and the meaning it has? Very important question. Different philosophical traditions will continue that important discussion. And then the other very important question for the traditions, the grammarian tradition of this, is the unit, basic unit of meaning, is it words or is it a sentence? And the, that's that in in analytical contemporary 20th century philosophy that is discussed as a context principle in philosophy of language. Again, what is the basic unit of meaning? In other words, is a word enough to fix the meaning or do you need a sentence to fix the meaning of a word? Okay, for a very simple example, you could say uh, the chair is a very difficult person. Now you might say that doesn't make sense at all. The chair is a difficult person. But the word chair, so the point here is this, that the word chair is not, the meaning of the word chair in this here is not fixed just by the word chair as pointing to this chair here. I mean, to this, uh, you know, this object called chairs. Because when I'm saying uh, the chair, okay, let me rephrase it. The chair is a very nice person. And then I can either point to that chair, I can point to him as a chair. And that meaning of the word chair is only fixed in the context of a sentence, not by itself. And that debate about what are the theories of meaning, how does meaning get fixed, which occupies these philosophers for a very long time, to me is one of the most insightful understanding of language, which is so relevant to any language you talk about today, any context of language. And I can use the same question to ask about an electron. You know, something which may come from contemporary modern science and say, what does the word electron point to? And I'm using particularly the case of an electron because it shows the complexity of scientific thinking. But here I'm using an old philosophical, theoretical thinking to show you how relevant it is to this question. Suppose I say an electron. Now, what is a physicist going to do? If I ask a physicist, what is an electron? You are saying the word electron. I don't understand it. What does it mean? If you, if I tell you the word bottle and you say, I don't understand the word bottle, what does it mean? I can point to it or I can give you this bottle. How does a, how does a scientist give you the meaning of the word electron? Because remember, there's no difference between the sound electron and the sound bottle. Both are two different sounds. That's all. Once you hear a sound, you're making an inference to something. That, it, that sound stands for an object. So, how, does, how do you analyze this relationship? How do you know what it stands for? Is there an object called electron which is like the bottle, which a scientist can point to and say, oh, this is an electron. But there is no such object which is available to us. I mean, even if electron is a unified, unit, unified entity, 
it's microscopic which none of us can see so how does the word electron get its meaning to do to answer scientists are not going to answer that question scientists are going to tell you there is an electron i'll do something with electron i'll build you a the computer screen or a tv screen and show you how electron how what use i can put the electron into but it is not going to tell you a theory of meaning of an electron and for that you go back to philosophers you go back to ancient philosophers who have done extensive work on trying to understand the relationship between meaning and sound and in fact it is not that just you go back to old philosophical thinking it is that you don't have any other form of thinking which can answer this question except philosophical thinking done over centuries so it depends on the questions you ask and what kind of fundamental questions you need to understand so as philosophers we want to understand the basics the foundational structures and like i often say for me at least in my practice of philosophy what is very important is conceptual clarity i don't want to use words i don't understand i want to understand them very clearly and philosophy whether it's a past or contemporary whatever it's we want to use it whichever can illuminate me on that help me understand the concept very deeply i think it does a great task which no other discipline can do so what i'm trying to say is we know that there are these kinds of continuity even between the past and the modern science which is present i mean which uh, which arises in some sense and which breaks away from what we call as uh, uh, philosophy like as i said within that there is another interesting story which we need to take account of which is the fact that when i say newton was a natural philosopher it's in more it might seem to suggest that you know philosophy is doing something which science aspires to do but we should remember post newton particularly leading up to the materialists leading up to people like ernest mark there is a great division between philosophy and science and that division between philosophy and science happens happens right from bacon in sense where already very important methodological questions are posed to philosophy one as i said just scholarship alone talking about other writers and saying aristotle said this aristotle said that was that going to help in the production of scientific knowledge so there is a critique of that two there was a critique of the fact that philosophy was not did not dirty his hands sufficiently it was not part of the world in that sense and that there was a need for a creation of knowledge which was about the material world and whose aim and purpose was to convert that knowledge into technologies which can interfere with the world now philosophy seemed to be more at the level of i want to just understand its basics and it doesn't seem to be worried about how to understand the basics into creating technologies which can do things for the world and that's not the task and purpose of philosophy every discipline that you think of is defined by you know when we say disciplines it looks as if they're all been artificially created and somebody says you are doing science somebody says geography somebody calls management and so on but remember that fundamentally the way in which you can distinguish disciplines are there are many aspects of it i would look at three or four very important aspects of distinguishing one discipline the first is the objects of discourse that is the kind of objects which each discipline studies physics is going to study nature let's say natural phenomena and social science is going to study social phenomena there are different objects which you focus upon in order to understand it the second is the methods by which you study those objects so you have objects of study objects of discourse methods of studying those objects and the third very important which we don't pay sufficient attention to is the purpose of that discourse there's a very specific purpose for which you do that kind of a study for example when science is studying nature it is studying nature in order to control duplicate and uh, control dupli uh, and uh, uh, control manipulate and duplicate nature that's a very important purpose of science in other words what i'm trying to say is purpose defines what disciplines are philosophy could also be looking at nature so natural philosophers they're also looking at nature 
But the purpose of philosophical knowledge, or what you're producing out of philosophical thinking about nature, is not the purpose of scientific knowledge about nature. Because look at the uh, classic uh, ethical question which came a few years back about cloning. The sheep Dolly was cloned. There are, I, I've heard that in China there are cloning experiments on humans and so on. Um, so look, look at that particular point, what it says about science. I mean, the question of ethics of cloning is different. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about what does it say about scientific knowledge. Cloning is probably possible if you understand very deeply human biological processes. So one can have knowledge of human biology at a very deep level and be satisfied with it and say, oh, I now know how the body works. But scientific knowledge is not that. The, the purpose of scientific knowledge is not to say, oh, I know how it works. It is to go one step. It is to say, how can I control nature knowing how it works so well? You learn about um, you know, what you do with natural phenomena in order to be able to build dams, in order to control you know, disasters which may affect human civilization. Control of nature is a very important step of scientific knowledge. You don't see that within the philosophical understanding of nature. When philosophers are understanding nature, they're not saying the aim of understanding nature is to be able to control nature and ultimately to duplicate nature. And like many commentators often point out, the aim of science is to become God, is to be the creator in that sense, in that model. Because it is not enough by saying, I know how science works. It wants to be able to duplicate the objects of creation or objects of that is, the natural world has to be recreated. And the cloning is just one example. And if you think that that's a failure or it's not getting through, etc., you know, I can tell this to you with great confidence that the kind of experiments, today the cutting edge of work in the sciences is in biology and life sciences, not in any other discipline. And the kind of work which is happening there is not like any of the sciences which are happening in, let's say, like physics and chemistry. Because there are so many secretive programs which happen in biology, production of biological organisms, and reproduction of biological organisms, which we have very little clue about. That is really the cutting edge. That is where most of the money is. That's where most of the, you know, a lot of IP, everything is present in that, because the real holy grail for science is recreation of human life. And if, when that happens, you realize, you know, science would have come to a kind of a maturity of the purpose. But the real point which distinguishes the philosophical reflection of nature, as I mentioned, still is captured with the different purposes of producing that knowledge. And therefore, purpose really dictates what we do with this. I'll give you another classic example. So look at social sciences. You know, session and talk a little bit more about it. But remember that the social sciences, the objects of study, it can be, you know, groups, kinship, etc, etc. You know, studying communities and so on. You may study social characteristics like religion, caste, etc. But there is a purpose is also very important for it. And the purpose of social science, like as is practiced in sociology, for example, today, across the world, is to give tools to order society better. It is to give, produce tools, use your understanding in order to convert it into social policies. It is not about a theory of human, which a lot of philosophers like to write about. What is a theory of human? What is a theory of society? What is friendship? That is just about understanding something. But it is not meant for the purpose of either social ordering, controlling society, or producing social policies which is what the purpose of social scientific knowledge is. So there is a very deep divide which happens post um, you know, in this particular question. And you know, very often people catalyze it, I mean, point this, uh, point this, this division by pointing to this uh, division between religion and science, which is this famous story of Galileo and Galileo's conflict with the church and so on, which I'm sure all of you have read about. But, you know, 
I think the question of the church science divide, and specifically in the European context, is actually um, has to be understood in far more complex ways. And there's not a simple, um, you know, distinction between the practices of science and uh, practices of religion. There is one aspect there upon which a lot of it hinges. And this whole distinction hinges a lot, which is reproduced in a lot of these debates even today. And that is a question of authority. And that goes back to your philosophical problem, which is that scientific truths are not legitimized and validated by authority. And that scientific truths are open to falsification. Are open, and in other words, scientific knowledge is always fallible, which means it could be proved wrong, whereas um, doctrinal knowledge is not fallible. It is accepted as truth. There is that uh, divide between the way science understands the nature of authority and knowledge as against authority and other forms of knowledge, not just religious knowledge. It could be traditional knowledge, religious knowledge, uh, knowledge within communities, societies and families and so on, which is what is really put into uh, a great contrast with the nature of scientific knowledge. But again, this is a very large story. It doesn't capture the complexities of the way authority functions within science itself and how authority functions in the creation of scientific knowledge itself. But that's a, a you know that can take us a little bit uh, far, uh, far. What I wanted to point out here is that even though philosophy and science split to the extent that over the last few decades, if you look at some of the most important, I mean some of the most important scientists, including Stephen Hawking and Weinberg, uh, Weinberg was also a Nobel Prize winner. Um, in their books, they take a very strong position against philosophers and philosophy of science. So they point out that philosophy of science has nothing to contribute to science because philosophy of science is a completely different activity which has nothing to do with science and that philosophers of science do not understand science. So they feel that they misunderstand science, they bring other kinds of irrelevant questions to our understanding of science. Now this prejudice about philosophy of science is so deep among the science community that as I was telling somebody over tea that we have built some of the science and science and technology institutes in our country like the IITs and ICERs and yet there is deep resistance within these institutions to hire people in philosophy, particularly philosophy of science. There is a suspicion towards philosophy of science. They feel that philosophers, when philosophers bring their philosophical questions to analyze science, they are only detracting it from the merit of doing science. So one of the great criticisms they have of philosophy of science is, you know, there are many types of philosophy of science. There are many types of inquiries from philosophy of science. But they think any time philosophy of science brings in questions of society, gender, caste, religion, and human creativity, etc., it dilutes the objective, rational character of science. And in that, scientists are deeply mistaken. And while they might resist it, it is true that philosophy of science like philosophy of language, like philosophy of arts, like philosophy of anything, illuminates the nature of science far better than scientists themselves can. And I often use this example, right? So you can, I'll give you two simple examples. A person who is in the bank, who is a teller in the bank, you know, who gives you money, etc., on the counter. Now, that person might be the person who handles money more than any of us in the world. Because every day, 100 people go to that person and uh, she will uh, you know, have to give money to 100 people. So she uses money far more than any of us can. But just because she knows how to count money, do things with that money, the currency, does it mean she understands the concept of money better than economists who study money? What I'm trying to say is, just because you can do something doesn't mean we know that thing or we understand that. It's a very simple observation, right? So if you're driving a mobile, you know, a motorbike, you may be very good, uh, you know, you speed around, do whatever things you want to do with it, but you may not know how it works. Would you know why you have to put petrol there and why the petrol injunction, injection of the petrol and then the spark plug, what is the function of the spark plug? 
how does the internal accelerate how does the motor bike move this puts a petrol in it why do i add oil to it without knowing it you can still be one of the best users of the motor bike and the last example is language all of us are very good in language we can read and write so effortlessly in whatever language many of us probably do it in different languages three two three languages but yet we don't know the nature of language like a linguist does a linguist will tell me things about kannada or malayalam or tamil much more in greater detail of what is the structure of language why does that word sound like this why does this word always go with another word why are plurals of this form why are the past tenses of this form in different languages they know all of that that's their job they have understood it they have studied it they have analyzed it but nothing has stopped you from being a good user of language without knowing its foundational aspects of language and i use all this argument to say the same thing about science you can be a very good scientist without even knowing the foundational aspects of what science is and sometimes scientists get a little bit upset when they hear this because they feel that just because they do science they know about science that's not true and that puts a kind of a tension between philosophy philosophy philosophical reflection on science and the practice of science but independent of that the philosophy of science uh, continues i mean much of the most fundamental aspects of science are still illuminated only by philosophy of science i'll give you just a few examples here just to give you uh, to show you how much science is ignorant about scientists are ignorant about their own practices of science even though they may do great science just give you a few examples one of the founding concepts one of the central concepts in physics for example is the the concept of laws of nature laws laws of nature you have all remember from your school you know about newton's laws laws of motion for example you know about laws of gravity of newton again two objects m1 m2 attract each other some force you are sure you know of coulomb's law of electric charges two charge q based on distance etc so you know all that stuff they are all called laws but what are laws of nature you know a lot of scientists put a lot of investment on the ideas of laws of nature and you discuss uh, discover a law of nature it's like one of the great discoveries you can be pretty sure you get a nobel prize but what is this idea of a law of nature you know it's only philosophers who have been sticking to this question and pointing out and have shown us some of the most interesting ways of understanding science by focusing on this question of laws of nature because you know what laws of nature actually comes from and when i say philosophy here a lot of very interesting work comes from history of science which points out a very important aspect of creation of science you know we think sometimes science is just about some scientists talking about natural phenomena etc but one of the greatest challenges to the production of science is first of all the first starting step which you need before you start doing science because look at the definition of science science is some systematic knowledge systematized system or a system of knowledge about nature it's a very simple largely correct definition of science it's about natural phenomena and it gives you some system systematized knowledge about natural phenomena okay that's largely captures a lot of what we call the science but remember there's a hidden point here which philosophers have been harping on repeatedly which is in this definition that science is a study of nature there is no definition of what nature is i hope you see this point it's one of the most profound uh, yeah one of the most profound arguments from the sciences we don't know what nature is somebody has to define what nature is how do you define what nature is so science is willing you know i can study the bottle once you tell me this object bottle and i give it to you please study so i can take it to my lab and do whatever i want but you tell me science is study of nature so what is nature and what is very interesting is nature as defined by physicists is different from nature as defined by chemists and different from nature as defined by biologists for biologists evolution is such an important description of nature 
in physics you will never encounter evolution there are no models of which you don't talk about evolution in the way biologists understand evolution of nature as a, as an essential component of understanding physics in other words to be able to study something i first have to define that thing unless it is an object in front of me which is perceivable but nature is not perceivable you can say nature is everything that raises another deep philosophical problem such a essential core problem which even today we don't know how to resolve which is i am studying nature the scientist is studying nature and nature is that which is outside me i am studying the green color of the tree and uh, stone falling etc what about me am i a part of nature if i am part of nature how can i study something which is outside me because that is nature is inside me which means okay think about this the implications of this if this object is outside me i can do things to the object and study it you could call it as an epistemology of an out external object so the object is outside me i am the observer i can do things i can break it jump on it heat it etc but suppose i am part of nature and i am studying nature that's a completely different epistemology it's completely different methodology the assumptions and implications are fundamentally different so how does how do what is your nature then and what history of science shows so well is how different ideas of nature as far as nature as an object is first constructed before modern physics is possible it starts very different ways when galileo for example says a very important point of galileo that nature is that which can only be described in mathematical terms and how does he understand this use of mathematics he says something very interesting he says this about nature which means he is defining the characteristic of nature which is not seen by all of us you know what he says he says nature is an open book written in the language of mathematics and to be a scientist is to read that book of mathematics in other words just like we have different languages okay i may speak kannada tamil malayalam etc those are my languages he claims that mathematics is the language of nature and that is why to do science you have to use mathematics without knowing mathematics you can't do physics because he has given this human quality of having a language to nature i think nature is mathematics but that's his definition of nature which allows him to do the physics he does if he doesn't have the definition he cannot do the physics he does so you create the object you want to describe that's very different from okay i just think we'll stop at this point and then we can come back to it it's okay think of what is happening here and you know please think about it because it's, i think a very important aspect which is this that i can describe things which i see in front of me let's say the plant or i can also describe things which i create like this bottle i create the bottle i can i have far more control over this because i created i know how i have created it i can describe and do things with this whereas a natural world which i have not created you know i have to do something with it what i'm trying to say is the idea of nature upon which all idea of science is based is itself a creation of the scientific practice and unless i start with it i cannot start to do it so when physicists say laws of nature they are adding a quality to nature which we don't know that it has or not and i leave you with this point because it's a very deeply troubling philosophical point and i'm sure as philosophy students you will enjoy this laws of nature comes from divine laws there's a long history of how the idea of laws of nature comes into physics it comes from divine laws and social laws and what are social laws uh, like a uh, you know if i uh, see a signal light it says red and i have to stop the car let's say i'm following the rules given by society those are laws of a society i have to pay my tax i have to pay my tax i'm following the rules what does laws of nature mean it means two objects two masses m1 and m2 have to obey the law of nature that is obey the law of gravity right now think about this who is making these two objects obey this 
I obey the law because I have to obey it. If I don't obey it, there is a penalty for it. I am forced to obey it because there is a need for me to obey it. Why do two objects in nature, why should they obey a law? Who has given that law to the law, two objects to follow? You see the point. Many physicists call this as governance, that laws govern nature. What is this idea of governance? What is this agency of nature? So some would argue, like I tend to argue sometimes, that either you have a picture of nature in which God governs the world. But then when science removes that agency of God, it replaces it with the agency of nature. Nature governs itself. Nature does this. Nature does that. I'm saying that sounds very interesting. But please tell me, what is this nature which has the power to govern, which has the power to make its objects obey its rules? What is that nature? That's a philosophical question. It's only philosophers who can illuminate this question for science. To make science understand what it is doing at its most basic assumptions of all sciences. Okay, I'll stop here. So thank you, sir, for enlightening us on the relation of philosophy and science. You shared with us that science takes its foundational aspects, like structures of thinking, structures of analyzing, etc., from philosophy. And you also shared with us the difference between philosophy and science, both have their own uh, different objects, methods, uh, methodology and purposes. For example, a philosopher study the nature totally in a different way, unlike the ethicist. So it was really an enlightening one and you presented it in a lucid and clear style. So let's put our hands together to appreciate the enlightening talk. Now it's time to air out your questions and doubts. We will take a few questions. We'll have five minutes for discussion. Yeah, yes, Father. Sir, you were also talking about Stephen Hawking, in whom I am doing my thesis now, doctoral thesis, The Concept of Time. In his book, A Brief History of Time, he says, the universe is self-sufficient, as you said, mentioned. It can create itself. So it doesn't need any, any extra creator. So even when, when I studied philosophy in the uh, few years, first year, I had the temptation of saying, after studying about evolution, um, perhaps man evolved and created God. But afterwards, I anyway regained faith, using that if there are physical laws, there should be other of the law. That is my conviction. So is there any proof, according to any scientific proof, to prove the existence of God using science, maybe quantum mechanics, whatever it is. Yeah. One more question. Thank you, Professor, for your talk. Uh, my question is regarding the methods of science. So it is clear from your talk that science has its limitations in epistemic methods which it is using. But why doesn't it open itself to philosophy to accept more epistemic structures or epistemic methods so that it can be wider in understanding nature? And, and adding on to that, uh, what you said at the end, I have something to say on what Thomas Aquinas said. There has been instances in history that what is the case becoming what ought to be the case. So there is some problem with that nature governing nature in that particular phrase, I think. Thank you. One more question. If not. Uh, this is based on your talk, uh, Professor Sarukai. 
humans are also philosophers. Now, scientists are also humans. Now, uh, as if I understand correctly, philosophers are more theoreticians and scientists practitioners. Can we think about a, a man, a human person, both a theoretician and a practitioner? Why do we bifurcate between uh, doxa and praxis? Like the Greeks thought about a philosopher king. Can we today talk about a philosopher scientist, a philosopher economist, a philosopher sociologist? sociologist? Is anything wrong, inbuilt mistake? Or is it just verbal articulations? Okay. Um... No, you, the first question about universal, see, uh, f f science has a lot of models because it has to answer this question, right? Of governance of universe or how did the universe come into being? So if they have to move away from the creator picture and the larger theological arguments, which have been very influential before, then they have to come up with this emergent questions. You know, that's also a very um, popular idea now that you put things together and things emerge. You don't need an agency, a particular causal mechanism for something to emerge. So when they talk about life as not being created, then one of the counter examples is life is emerged. And how does life emerge? Life emerge, you put in some 10 chemicals together, some set of conditions, and the conditions randomly evolve out of which something called life emerges. And there's no agency. See, they're all worried about question of agency. Because the divine is a, an agent in the context of creation, right? Somebody who decides to say, this is how the world should be. I want to create something like that. In the very naive idea of creating, I'm saying. So for science, the only way to uh, come out of that is self-evolution, self-ordering. That is also a very important part of scientific models. Self-ordering. You don't need an agent to order the world. Remember that the design argument, again from theology, Right, if you, you look at a, a clock and it's such a complex uh, design that that cannot be random and arbitrary. Somebody, there must have been a designer. Right? That's a very fundamental argument for creation. So they overcome the designer argument by saying, no, things uh, randomly evolve into these designs. You don't need to have had an order. So it's called self-ordering mechanisms that the organism itself will evolve in particular ways. And there are many examples of very interesting things about self-ordering in biology and so on. So what I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, this any time you have of the self-ordering or self-creation is one alternate model to agency of individual, you know, or particular creators and so on. But that's very different from the question of God as a object for science. Like as I said, every discourse needs its objects of discourse, objects it wants to study. I would say that science is very open to studying God. Absolutely no problem about it. If God can be made empirically accessible according to the rules of scientific method, it will be very happily jump into this, uh, you know, so jump into the mix and say, Let, we'll also do experiments on God. We will look at that. You give that to me as an accessible entity. I will, so... Science has always taken this position. What they disagree with, and that's what I was saying about Galilean method also, very important point. When he says, natural phenomena are there. Now, what is it to do science? I will not use supernatural agency to describe natural phenomena. So I can, let's say I have a, a, a lightning. I can use a more common example, eclipse. So eclipse was often defined in various cultures through so-called supernatural phenomena. That is not of the of this world. It needed, you know, like the Rahu Ketu example, etc. Some two snakes eating each, you know, swallowing the sun, etc. He said, instead of using supernatural elements, to do science is to use elements of nature to describe natural phenomena. But there again, remember the hidden subtlety is what is nature? Why is God not part of nature? Right? And then the cyclic argument is nature is that which obeys laws of nature. So, I mean, there is a lot one can unpack in this. So I'm just giving you a very quick uh, argument about that. And it has related questions of proof and so on. So maybe we can 
talk about it later. Uh, it's also, your question is also related to methods of science. Why is it not open to philosophical method? You know, very interestingly, Newton in his Principia, when he talks about methods he uses, I think if I remember it's four or five, he calls them philosophical methods. He's not listing them as scientific methods. He lists philosophical methods and gives the various methods which he's supposedly writing this book with. Okay, that's his method. So uh, the point is, sci modern science is created when it makes a particular choice of methods. And it begins with Galileo, very important argument that I can describe natural phenomena. I can describe, philosopher can describe it. A poet can describe a stone falling, correct? A philosopher can describe stone falling. A scientist can describe it. But what is important for a scientific description is that a scientific description should be de described in terms of measurable concepts. So a scientific description of a stone falling is only, it's not a description of how I'm feeling when I watch the stone fall or a particular song started in me when I saw the song fall or I thought of God when I saw the song. No, a scientific description is what are the measurable terms of the thing? A stone is falling from a particular height. It takes a particular time. It has a particular measurable speed. So a scientific description can only use measurable concepts. That also links it to mathematics and so on. That's all. So one, it's, it's, so it's not just about the methods. It's also about the forms of description. And what, so any method which can give you measurability, you know, science will be open to accessing it. Absolutely no problem. So it's about, as I said, it's about the goals and purposes, right? That's a very important part. And uh, the ESOT is a very important problem in science and values, as we know, ethics and science particularly. Um, so I, I, I mean, that'll take us too much long, but yeah, the, it's inter the point you make is interesting about the nature and the ESOT question. There's a lot on it um, about what, you know, uh, where the is and what comes in the context of definitions of nature. Um, but yeah, but it's, it's a really interesting subject to think about. Um, the last point, um, uh, you know, Father Kurian, I just want to point out that I was not trying to say, yeah, I'm saying the criticism of philosophers have been that they are, you know, like systems thinker or armchair thinkers, etc. Whereas within science, not all scientists are, of course, as we know, uh, practitioners, that, but science as a discourse has an essential element of practice. practice. And that's why I've always been saying that uh, philosophy as, an, as, a, as a discipline has an essential component of practice. All ancient philosophies, medieval philosophies were practice oriented and it could be theology as practice. But if you look at Indian philosophical traditions, all filled with practice. You cannot not do practice and just do philosophy. If you look at Buddhist logicians, for example, who I think are one of the world's greatest logicians in terms of the kind of logical analysis that they did, it is always related to their practices, the rituals they involved in or whatever, those are part of life practices which are integral to their doing their logic. They are not two different things. So I, I'm, I'm just saying that that is the model of philosophy which we need to recapture. And in that sense, uh, there is a lot related. I'm, so I'm not making the heritage and practitioner distinction as between philosophy and science. And as, as you correctly said, there are many examples of how there is a book, for example, which I have, which is called The Philosopher Scientist, for example. Einstein is often used as a famous example of it. But many of them is also because they were trained because of the German tradition, like you were also saying a time back. They are also trained in philosophy, even as a science student. So there's been a far more interesting engagement, particularly with German uh, scientists and philosophy, which you don't see as much in the Anglo-American world. There's uh, quite a marked uh, skepticism about philosophy by British scientists, for example, and so on. So... That's a, I think it's a very cultural uh, aspect of it. But I think if you look at uh, sociologists, for example, many social theorists draw from philosophy, which is what I talk about now. And, you know, so there is a mix of the, uh, the philosophical and the practitioner very deeply in all these disciplines. Okay. So Father President was exploring the possibility of a philosopher scientist, but I think you know, Professor Sunnar it's a living model of a philosopher scientist amidst us. So thank you for this session. So by this, we are coming to the end of this second session and over to Brother Chess. Now we are entering into the third and final session of our lectures. The topic of this session is 
philosophy and contemporary science. So, sorry, philosophy and contemporary societies. What do you, Father Jojo? So, without much break, we are moving to the third session. So, the topic, as already mentioned here, is philosophy and contemporary society. We know society is the largest larger context in which a question of philosophy should be rightly answered and interpreted. So without uh, taking much time, over to Professor. Thank you. I think you've all been really patient sitting through all these talks. It's uh, really happy to see that. Um, yeah, I, I know we've been talking about a variety of topics, but I hope I've been trying to show you one argument, one stream of an argument, a thing through. Okay. So the idea of contemporary, the function of philosophy in trying to make sense of the world, the natural and the social world. And uh, for me, the study of contemporary societies is extremely important function of philosophy. And I, I, that's the reason why I specifically chose this topic, uh, because there's a lot we could have talked about on philosophy of science, etc. Uh, the question of contemporary society is extremely important because philosophy has a very important role to play in our attention and understanding of these societies. And I want to uh, look at the way that this has happened and how, I'll, I want to give you two examples um, from uh, the two books I've written with Gopal Guru, uh, both on social theory and social science in Indian context, in order to give you an example of how we look at the question of philosophy's engagement uh, with the social science. Okay, very briefly, you know, unlike natural science, which makes a drastic departure in terms of method, in terms of the aims of, uh, uh, I mean, between philosophy and sciences, natural sciences, the case of social sciences is a little more complex. Firstly, as the name itself suggests, social science, when it is, comes to be in the early 19th century, uh, is modeled actually on science. So August Comte is often, uh, uh, we, are, we are often pointed out that August Comte's first definition of social science is social physics. He uses the term social physics. The idea is very simple. So that idea is far more interesting, which is, what is the idea? That Comte's idea was that you should study societies like physicists study nature. That's all that he was asking for. In other words, studying society means what? Describing the society, explaining why certain social phenomena happen. For example, let's say there's poverty in society. Then a scientific study of it should be able to say, what are the causes of poverty? What are the reasons that poverty grows in a society? And so on. So, social science, he said, he gave a model for how to study society and he said the model is do it like the scientists do for nature. So we do it for society. But what is it that scientists do? Scientists, for him the very important part was, of course scientists make observations, right? Scientists make descriptions. Scientists make experimentation. There is no science without experimenting on nature. You really keep doing various experiments on nature. And then Scientists study nature objectively. And this was a very important point in the beginning of social sciences. That is, can I study human society objectively like scientists study nature objectively? What does objectively mean? Can I be a dispassionate observer and analyst of social sciences? Dispassionate in the sense, I am not interested in my own personal beliefs, likes and dislikes. Can I call something out for what it is. So, for example, if, uh, you know, lightning destroys a tree in front of me, I'm, I, I'm giving a scientific objective description is to say that lightning, you know, destroyed the tree. Right? Now, can we do that in social uh, descriptions? So, suppose I see the government is doing something to some people. Today. Will I use the same term like, am I going to be objective in saying the government Or will I say 
what my political affiliation is i'll say no no this government has supported these people another group is that this government has destroyed these people what kant is trying to push us towards is to see how is an objective analysis of society possible that is the task of social science that's what being a social scientist should be that is call out the truths of society independent of your relationship to the community of people this is one of the biggest difficulties and the challenges of making study of society a scientific study so i want to go back to it we emphasize this point anything can be studied in many different ways i can study this as an artist with an artist eye i can say something about it i can say the design is not good the color could have been better you know i could have studied it analyzed it through artistic concepts i could have analyzed it through concepts of um physics or material sciences that is i can tell you about the the plastic and whether it's a good chemical to use and what material the cap has been made etc same object i can analyze it by a study of labor i can tell you which is the community of people who created this how did they produce the water where did they get the water from in the context of making this water so analysis studying something you can do it in 100 ways but studying it scientifically has certain imposition certain rules be objective be measurable so when social science wants to study poverty for example objectively and wants to study it scientifically which is measurable look at what will happen i'll give you one example let's look at poverty so you can study poverty in many different ways how can you study poverty you can go look at the suffering of people who are poor you can write a poem about it you can write a story about it you can write a song about it that is studying and describing that right what is being poor what is suffering of people but what is it to do a scientific study of poverty to do a scientific study of poverty is to produce objective qualities and measurable quantities of poverty and that's why when the government does poverty schemes and policies for poverty look at the government's definition of poverty any government's definition of poverty will be like what it's not based on individual suffering it's not based on the fact that somebody is suffering so much that they are poor if you look at all the reports on poverty for the last few uh, reports that have been coming out which is what one of the reports will say if people who earn less than what 32 rupees or something a day will be called as bp so what does it do it studies poverty by using measurable parameters because now it allows the government to tell you how many people are poor who are poor anybody who earns less than 30 rupees a day they are poor it's not about suffering it's not about what their life is all about it's not about equity it's not about equality access justice it's about a measurable concept 30 rupees a day the earlier measure was what number of calories each would be taken any person who took who uh, consumed calories less than whatever 1000 let's say 1000 or 2000 calories is poor and that gave them some measure that's a scientific study of poverty i'm not saying one is less than the other i'm just saying that you can have different types of study and to do a scientific study is to do it objective measure measurable makes it more objective so instead of you saying oh that person is also poor this person is poor the government would say look i don't care whether you think they are poor they are suffering or this person is suffering anybody who earns less than 30 rupees that is poor for me suffering doesn't come into the picture because suffering is not a scientific measurable term so social science is caught between these two very interesting things it's caught between philosophy and the natural sciences why to be a science it has to speak like this science but social science in its heart at its core comes from why is it because social science is fundamentally about human societies and you cannot understand human society without understanding the human being the individual human individual and the relationship between the many things like friendship kinship love hate all of them 
without it you can't understand what a society is and the discipline which has invested so much on this nature of being human is philosophy so ideally you know to answer your question also what are the methods can you use right the natural sciences and all social science is actually a subset should be a subset of philosophy because that's where all its material information on all these questions about human beings etc comes but it's now put as a clash by putting scientific method on a philosophical concepts you know poverty is a deeply um, you know not just interesting very important concept of philosophy it's a philosophical concept but when you convert it into social science you put certain scientific methodological uh, constraints on it in order to for whatever reasons purpose of it or not so social science is caught in this all the time between trying to satisfy its philosophical origins and its scientific uh, you know roots to the extent that if you look at social theory you know look at any important social theorists Etc. They are all doing philosophy. You know, when they are writing about democracy and justice, they are doing philosophy. In a sense, they are of course redoing something Plato, etc. And we, you know, think about that. Uh, you, if you could, if you are drawing on other philosophical tradition, you could use other ancient African traditions to talk about democracy, equality, justice, and so on. But social theorists tend to be drawing on philosophy all the time. It's only sociologists who are particularly interested in. you know empirical methods empirical work about societies who are more so called scientifically oriented so a lot of sociologists about statistics using mathematical terms etc so but because of this um, kind of a, the the tension between doing philosophy to study understand society and doing science to do a scientific study of society there is a constant confusion between what social science is doing how it is drawing upon both philosophy and uh, philosophy and science because remember that social science has another very important uh, similarity to natural science which is that social science is empirical you know and i'm not saying philosophy is not empirical but social science is deeply empirical in the sense social scientists are on the streets they are looking at the streets they're looking at the empirical world of societies out of which they have to construct explanations descriptions etc so that raises that makes it look like a natural science that makes it look like so therefore the purposes of natural science and social science are also interestingly overlapping because if natural science purpose of its knowledge is to control nature the knowledge of social science is to control societies and order societies it's a very important part including social policies which you do uh, you you need you want that knowledge in order to have control over it a very good example in natural in social sciences comes from uh, what is a discipline called area studies area studies came into being after world war 2 and uh, largely from the us and the reason area studies you know area studies is what middle east studies india studies pakistan studies china studies and so on that is studying the particular society culture and they are studying it in a whatever academic sense so now there are huge departments today india studies and china studies are the most flourishing um, you know groups within various of the top american universities and so on and it's very interesting why area studies came up after world war 2 when the us confronted what had happened in world war 2 it felt that it had not understood the societies with which there were all these conflicts particularly the middle east so they create area studies as a way of gathering knowledge about those societies so that your control over what happens in those societies is far better and that's an explicitly accepted reason for the creation of a whole sub discipline of social sciences called area studies okay so we know that there is a strong overlap between uh, the philosophy and the, the the purposes of the goals and aims of science goals and aims of philosophy as far as social science and science is concerned but you know in the in the in the way we have been talking about um, as uh, uh, philosophy there has also been a very deep difficulty in 
drawing upon philosophy in the study of societies. Okay, although you will see there's a lot more overlap, especially in Western social theoretical traditions of drawing upon earlier philosophers, um, but there is actually been far greater difficulty in understanding non-Western societies through philosophical agencies. And I want to um, open up your ways of thinking about it in the context of Indian society. Just to show you, give you some examples of the challenges which we have faced and, um, you know, new ways of, new kind of work which is waiting to be done by all of you uh, philosophy students into analyzing Indian societies. Now, what does it mean to apply or to use philosophy to study societies? Like as I said, you know, philosophy has developed certain tools and methods. Let's say ontology, for example, the kinds of things which exist. Um, epistemology, knowledge, and so on. You could use all these questions from ontology, metaphysics, epistemology into the study of society. So I'll give you two specific examples to uh, give you a background to this. And the first example is, in the context of Indian study in Indian society, uh, there is a particular problem in studying Asian and African societies. If you look at many of the works on studying these societies, you will find that, suppose I'm talking about democracy just as a lot of work on analyzing Indian societies draw upon uh, Western philosophical ideas. You know, typically, you can, you can go back to the Greek, but uh, European and European traditions. Um, but that also raises very interesting questions. Is it possible to analyze and study Indian society without drawing upon various philosophical traditions which flourished in India, ancient Middle which means ranging from um, your, uh, you know, the Sankhya, Buddhist, Jaina, Jaya, to the Christian and the Islamic tradition in India. Is it possible to understand our societies today, the contemporary society today, without drawing upon all these philosophical traditions? Or should we, why or would we think that just because we, I mean, just because social theorists have drawn upon Plato, Aristotle and Kant and others, Hobbes and Locke and so on, you could use them to understand Indian society or Asian and African societies in general. I think it's a very deep political problem. It's not just a problem of knowledge. It's a deep political problem. I'll give you one example of the work which we did with Dr. Sanjay who is a political scientist at JNU and now is the chief editor of the um, You know, we collaborated on a, a book in which we actually went back to looking at uh, a particular Indian social reality which is caste. And what is very interesting, and as philosophy students, it would be important for you to think about this. If you want to understand caste in India, you could do it in different ways. There's a lot of work on history of caste. There's a lot of work on political science and caste, okay? including political mobilization, political representation, and so on. There is, within sociology, if you look at Indian sociology, caste studies is very important. A lot of people study caste. They do a lot of empirical work on caste, the types of caste, enumeration of caste, and so many things. Okay. Now, go and look for, you know, different. What I'm saying is, caste is the object of study, and you can look at it through the lens of sociology. You can look at it through the lens of political science. You can look at it through the lens of economics. Okay. There's also a lot of work on economics and caste. And so and then I went back to this question of trying to understand the nature of caste. So what I was looking for is, what is the philosophy of caste? What, is, what does it mean to have a philosophical reflection of caste? Again, as philosophy students, I really want to raise this for you to think about. You know, what I found most interesting is, there is so little work on philosophy of caste. There is very little work on philosophical reflection on there is many things they say. There is we, there are there have been very strong criticisms of caste system, supporters of caste system. People were connected to various, uh, you know, Bhagavad Gita, for example, for validation, etc. But what is this fundamental philosophical idea, which seems to operate so deeply within our society to the extent that many sociologists will define societies like Indian societies as caste societies, fundamentally as caste societies, as an essential component. If that is the case, 
what is the work of all of us who study philosophy in india in understanding caste what is the kind of vocabulary what is the kind of methodology what is the kind of ways of looking at the world which comes from philosophy what are all of them when i look at this concept called caste so when this happened i am just giving an example just to illustrate this i'm sure there are various other ways of doing this um you know professor gopal guru had written a piece in epw many years back where he had asked a very provocative political question about uh, talking about dalits so he had written a paper a very important influential paper where he argues and he says why is it that in indian social science people who talk about dalits people who theorize about dalits are all non dalits and he coined a very nice phrase which is being used very often out there he called it as theoretical brahmins and empirical shudras where he said that the dalit community has become a community which is studied by other communities so other people write about the, you know the experiences of dalits and dalits just become what he called empirical subjects that is subjects who are open for description by others but who do not have the capacity to reflect on themselves so it's a very strong criticism of indian social science very powerful criticism so in response i wrote a piece or i actually catalyzed my piece okay stop uh, in response i wrote a piece saying that why is this what is the philosophical question i mean i'm drawing on phenomenology loosely what is this philosophical saying non dalits cannot talk about dalits because you know one of the response to his piece was saying why should we not talk about dalits what is the big deal we are scientists we are looking at the world outside we are looking at social reality we are describing it whereas gopal was saying no there is something intrinsic that should, does not allow you to describe that should not you should not keep describing people whose experiences you are not part of it is a classic instance of the limitations of the scientific within social science because there's nothing which stops you from discovering a lightning or a stone falling imagine a stone is falling somebody is telling you you don't have the right to describe how the stone falls only those people have the right we would think that's absurd we think all of us have an equal access to our describing nature but in society gopal raised this very important point so my response drew upon the idea of lived experience which the dalits have which no observer can access and so we entered into a very interesting um, discussion and the whole thing was uh, published as a book called the crack mirror in which we really went back to you know, two parts of the book was actually about looking at a philosophy of caste so i did what is called phenomenology of untouchability so we went back to untouchability as a basic concept and we tried to see what does it mean to philosophically reflect on untouchability because untouchability seems to be very simple that some people are not allowed to be touched by others and they cannot that's all that there is to it right but when we looked at it philosophically it was so rich so for example where if you look at various traditions philosophical traditions they make a distinction between contact and touch and what we pointed out is the very idea of untouchability is deeply indebted to theories of the body that you have theories of touch and touch remember not just in the indian traditions even for aristotle was a very important um you know object of philosophical thinking on the senses touch is a very important sense to look at and today there is so much of interesting work on the phenomenology of touch the meaning of what touch is so what we did in this book was to really look at take a simple uh, social reality of our society which is uh, namely caste looked at untouchability as a very important essential criterion of the caste system which defines the dalits and then showed a very interesting paradoxical relationship between brahmins and dalits both of whom are related to the question of okay. and so we did two pieces called phenomenology of untouchability and archaeology of untouchability and to us i think what i am saying about this because it showed us what the philosophical analysis of a simple social process is how it is possible and so I, after that we did another book following it which just came out two years ago 2019 late 2019 where 
we look at the nature of the everyday social which is the everyday social of indian life and why i'm saying this is to show how philosophy actually matters so what we actually talk about is what we call a social reality or social ontology and really look at how different indian social ontology uh, the indian social reality is different from other social social realities particularly of the western world so we're talking about asia africa middle east uh, the way in which society is philosophically described is radically different from the way we do it for other western societies based on ideas from philosophical practices philosophical methods and philosophical vocabulary and vocabulary like social ontology and um, you know i mean there's a lot in that book we can talk about but i just wanted to point out both of these to show that you know while philosophy or social science may seem as if it is caught between philosophy and social science methods in a sense what is far more meaningful and necessary for social sciences for all of us are the social philosophy and social theory is a radical relook at how you can philosophize about social phenomena social realities and for that it is you as all the students of philosophy who will have to find new ways of interpreting social reality interpreting the how you use you know philosophical terms in rediscovering the world around you i gave this example because if you want to make sense of the contemporary world if we want to have any notion of control over the contemporary world we need to invoke very different types of philosophy You know, this is the last point I'm going to say. That to me, it's always a very worrying point. A lot of people would say, "Look, we have no control over the society. You know, we have no control over the smartphones that have been given to us, all the cars and technologies and so on." Okay, we don't have control because we haven't thought enough about it. We don't write enough about contemporary societies. To me, the whole point of doing philosophy, learning all this critical thinking, all these texts, is to somehow find. the strength in those books to be able to reflect and show different ways of understanding contemporary societies because remember a very important thing you might say that you know there is smartphone there is contemporary technologies around but remember that that is the vision of a few people who want all of humanity to live like that we have had no say no control nothing at all in the way in which technology has been imposed on us or modern scientific society will be imposed and if you think that look this is the way natural evolution of society that's absolutely wrong there's no reason to believe that this is the natural progression of societies we are really being like puppets driven by very strong you know capitalist interest or high technology interest into living the world we are living in our daily and the only pause in this constant instant speed growth that pause has to come from philosophy it has to come from within ourselves and the way we can show others how to interpret the same phenomena we do that i think much of our task of doing philosophy is So in this third session, Professor Sundar was explaining explaining to us uh, how different social sciences are modeled on science, how we need to approach scientifically various social issues, uh, and also he was focusing on the issue of caste system, how we need to approach it, making use of our own Indian philosophies, etc., in order to become a better social philosopher. So. Let's put once more our hands together to express our wishes. So now we will take few questions. Back. Thank you, Professor, for your wonderful session uh, related to society and philosophy. Uh, I agree with you with the little philosophy, especially uh, what you said is right because uh, uh, other people, even uh, other people, other sessions are studying about the little 
and they have uh, they are not at all ready to study about themselves yeah i agree with you but at the same time when i think about society uh, just i am taking my village the people are very poor and poverty is there so i was going through the book of abhinav banerjee who is doing indian poverty he made the research and he got the academic uh, performance and he got international recognition so uh, in myself in my village there are some poets they will write poems about this poverty and beautiful poems uh, can, uh, in the my, my own local language vayar kariyunu kanni illa so they have their own beautiful languages of thinking pattern excellent but there are some other people they are scientifically studying the drinking habits of the family heads and the women they have no job the little children they need education so the measurement is there and after this measurement what is happening an upliftment and quality of life is changing and i'm confused dear professor because the poem is very good but it is not giving the wellness of the community but science is good because it is actually what improving the quality of life so how you uh, interpret this sentence thank you very much thank you professor for your good uh, presentation i would like to know about the knowledge and society two questions what is what is your idea about the knowledgeable society one another one is uh, the overload of the information how you uh, see uh, these two reality with this society maybe we will shortage of time thank you um yeah thank you for the jewels for pointing out the barefoot philosophy you know barefoot philosophy is an initiative which i started um, which is now please look at our website barefootphilosophers.org it is mainly to um create a initiative to bring philosophy to the public and also to children and others and to communities which are not part of the philosophy community as i said you know you're all an exception that you have such a good philosophy program here in most places for example if i remember right please correct me if i'm wrong as well as i knew till the last no college in bangalore offers a major in philosophy um as far as i know you know there are not there are no philosophy courses taught in any of our colleges in bangalore and as i said even bcu which started a ma program has closed it in two years so there is a kind of a crisis so i think part of it is to and i find it very odd because not because it's something which you know which is paying my salary but it is a discipline which i think is fundamental i mean it's it's it, we need to show why it is relevant how it is relevant and uh, it, it was a point when i was at nias i suddenly decided that you know after doing it so much for adults may doing all my summer schools and stuff maybe i should focus on children so i started a philosophy camp for children and the moment we thought of it people said why who if children are not going to come parents won't send children for philosophy why they are obviously not supporting them to do philosophy so why would they come and the first year we had you know when i just announced it we had over 100 applicants one nearly 150 applications of parents who and children who wanted to come so i did a series of philosophy camp in various places in rural karnataka we went to malappuram and did a fantastic uh, session with a, in collaboration with a group um uh, called cadence a group of uh, young muslim women who were trying to promote uh, education among their kids in uh, malappuram and you know it was we have done it across places and we found it is there is so much of interest in philosophy so much of desire to learn some of these things so i did this um, website uh, to get people to write about philosophy because there's another point which i often think about we read a lot of philosophers we have other writers interpreting our society the question is how are all of you going to write about society so we actually have children writing about philosophy we have students like many of you writing about philosophy so i i invite any of you who want to write for us or be engaged with that barefoot philosophy to please uh, you know contact me and i'll put you in touch it's it's a it's a it's a forum for you know public um 
spreading of that. We have no funds. I haven't got a paisa of fund for it after I left Nias. Earlier, I'd got a uh, trust fund from the Tata Trust to set it up, but that is to do the whole project. But with the but I just do it with my students and others who are interested. And uh, we are hoping that now with this children's book, which I have written called Philosophy for Children, which we are publishing in different languages, and the government is going to use it for their schools. We want to try and see if people can get interested in some of the basic ideas of philosophy, not as philosophers. There's no philosophers we talk about. Just these critical thinking, reading, writing, you know, those kinds of stuff, which we think are very important contributions of what philosophy does. Uh, so I really invite all of you to please, um, you know, enrich that and bring your perspectives and um, thoughts to that uh, website. So please contact me when you, if you're interested. Um, yeah, um, the, the point about Dalit and poems is very interesting. In fact, in Gopal, when he wrote that piece in EPW, points out that uh, Dalits write about their experiences as poems and raises the question why, and that's part of the discussion which then I write about, which he writes about uh, more on that, which is why is why are poems not accepted as epistemology, right? Why are they not seen as knowledge claims? Because they also talk about experience in so deep ways. And social science, you can't write a social science paper with poetry or with dialogues or with stories. And because you are the scientific epistemology or scientific knowledge is a particular structure. And so this is a big debate between literature and sociology and the link between them. But you have, I, I thought you were going to raise that, but you raised a more difficult question that with all the poems, etc., they might write about, which may be very evocative, but when people do science policies through these measurable parameters, their lives become better, right? So we need to make a distinction between social existence within a society, uh, where you can have various government schemes and benefits for which policies are very important, for which numbers are very important, right? So it is not either or, it's not, we are not in a position of choosing one or the other, but we are also in a position of not rejecting one completely. So in many of the calls, which we have uh, people, and also various changes in social science, we, people will say, how do you make the policies in uplifting that material well-being which is what the policies do, which is very important, probably for me, the more important one. But along with it, their cultural well-being also. There are other forms of well-being which they have. It could be religious, spiritual, or just, you know, happiness, etc. And that is the other side, the non-scientific side, which is about poems. I, I, if you ask, um, I'm not going to speak on behalf of any community, but let's say, uh, let's say my community was very deeply artistic and singing songs, and then the government uplifted me with various schemes, um, you know, but if I'm going to lose all my, uh, uh, you know, all my expression through poems and my artistic form, I would have lost a deep sense of our community. We may be we may be having now houses to stay in and water, which is very important, as I said, I don't want to negate it. But you would also have probably lost your identity as your community, as your past, etc. So some people would say, we don't want to do that. Some people would say, forget that past. We don't want that past. So this is in any, particularly in the Indian caste system, there are many different expressions of this uh, problem, okay? Um, then finally, the question of knowledge in society is again a very uh, difficult question because we are, you know, it might look like we are deeply knowledge societies, you know, given the scientific and technological thing. But I would, just as a point of argument, I would argue that we are actually becoming less of a knowledge society and becoming more of what you said as a second part, an information society. Uh, because knowledge, by definition, again, if you go back, if we look at our philosophical understanding of knowledge, what distinguishes knowledge from other forms of knowing, not knowing, like beliefs and guess and information or facts, is a kind of legitimization and justification. So there's more, both a component of truth and justification that makes something knowledge. And I think in the way we live in our society today, we don't possess knowledge. We just possess instruments. We, we have things we do but very little knowledge we have. In fact, we are now in far greater state of ignorance about the technologies we use than ever before. We our understanding of why your smartphone is working is much less than why your radio was working. You had far greater access to working of a small radio or a grinder 
uh, in the earlier so-called more non-digital technologies than with digital technologies and computer today. So we have completely replaced our understanding knowledge about society with things which we become, uh, you know, robotic actions of society. So we all, children know how to use smartphones when they're four and five years old. It's quite a remarkable revolution in the way technologies control societies. So you're very right. I think um, that has led, that, that is going to lead to far greater impact on society than any technologies before. Digital society is going, digital technologies are going to convert the nature of society so deeply that we will know in 20 years for sure, if not 10 to 20 years, the great impact they're going to have on very nature of being human beings. Thank you. Okay, so as we are coming to the end of this third session, Professor Sundar was inviting us uh, to think critically and to share our reflections with the wider society joining with him. So I think we know it is upon little, uh, uh, upon little wheels, great things stand. So by thinking critically, taking the inspiration received from Professor Sunnar on these three sessions. Let's think critically. Let's try to campaign our philosophy with the con various contemporary issues and in our own way, be that little wheels to transform our contemporary society. So once more, uh, putting our hands together, let's appreciate Professor Over to, over to them. Thank you, Father Zuzu, for moderating the two sessions. We move on to the concluding session of the lectures, and I invite Reverend Dr. Jos Nandikara, CMI, for the concluding remarks. Uh, dear Professor Sundar Sarikai, and friends of philosophy, lovers of wisdom. Wittgenstein once said, man has to awaken to wonder and so do the peoples. Science has a way of sending them to sleep. Wittgenstein was an engineer, studied in the famous Berlin School and later did a postgraduate studies in Manchester and then moved to philosophy. And he was very much in the scientific spirit when he said, all that we can see the truth are the propositions of natural science or the true propositions. But yet we cannot conclude that all that can be meaningfully said can be said by science, the rest of them as nonsense. Today, we were reflecting together with the Professor Sarukai, the importance of philosophy. To the extent that we are human beings, we are philosophers, beginning with that wonder. Sometimes we prefer to be sleeping the time rather than to awaken. Because the moments that we are awakened, we are challenged with the contemporary. As reflective beings, we ask the question not only what is it, how is it, and why is it, so what? As scientists, brilliant with the academic records, turned into philosophy, I listened to him a couple of times. I had three days with him in an inner psalm. And that was a great experience for me with the culture. I'm very happy here in the philosophy faculty and I enjoy teaching philosophy. And at the time, also I have a kind of dissatisfaction because philosophy finds people as the last question doesn't fill the stomach. And I tell you openly in the class, there are more practical things go and plant tapioca and learn fishing because people are dying of hunger. There are very meaningful things that we can do. Yet, even when all the scientific problems are solved, the problems of life remain untouched. Even when poverty is no more, we will have the questions, who am I? Why do I live? 
what is the significance? So I'm deeply interested in philosophy in practice, barefoot philosophy, taking philosophy to the children. Unless we become like children with a sense of wonder, we won't enjoy philosophy. Philosophy for many of you would be only two years of your intellectual formation as a preparation for your theological studies and priestly ministry. But we need to be reflective beings with a reflective practice. What does it mean to be a human being on this world? What does it mean to be most of us here uh, as a Christian, as a Christian minister, as a philosopher? We need to be having such reflections. Professor Sundar Sairikai, your discourses were very stimulating. I'm sure that would be reflected in our thinking in the faculty as well as among the students to do philosophy critically and creatively. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father, for your critical observations and valuable appreciations. Now I request Reverend Dr. Wilson Adatagaran CMI, Dean Faculty of Philosophy, to honor our speaker, Professor Dr. Sundar Sarukai, with a memento as a token of our gratitude. It is good to be grateful to all those who have taken tireless efforts for the success of this event. I call upon Reverend Brother Franklin to propose a word of thanks. Thing left and thing right and thing law and Think high. The things you can think will be success of life if you think high, says the great scientist Stephen Hawking. Respected Professor Dr. Sundar Sarke, Reverend Father President, Reverend Father Dean, Professors, and my dear friends. Indeed, we are especially privileged to embrace the warmth of wisdom shared by the 26th Dharma Endowment Lectures 2021. It's my pleasant duty to express sincere thanks to all the noble hearts who, have, who gave flesh and blood to make this endowment lecture as a successful reality. First of all, I thank the Almighty Lord for having brought us through his loving providence to be part of these endowment lectures. My life is an instant, a passing hour, a moment of escaping away to love God and the beautiful world I have only today. I think one who assimilates the spirit of saying is none other than Professor Dr. Sundar Sarukai, the speaker of the day. He's a distinguished personality who moves with his own personalized philosophy based on the theme philosophy and contemporary. He was helping us to reflect upon the notion of the contemporary in tune with science and technology by analyzing the function of philosophy during his brilliant talks. Dear Professor, let me express our deep sentiments of gratitude towards you for being with us today and having enriched us with your wisdom. On behalf of the Faculty of Philosophy, DVK, may I express our sincere thanks to you.
I extend my thanks to Dr. Kurian Kachapalli, the president of DVK, for his sincere cooperation and support. I would like to thank, I'd like to take this opportunity to place on record of our all-hearted thanks to Dr. Wilson Edatugaren, CMI, Dean Faculty of Philosophy, DVK, for his planning and guidance for making the enrollment lecture as a successful reality. I would like to thank the organizing team, staff members of our faculty, technical team headed by Father Rafi, office staff, volunteers, photographers, light and sound, refreshment team, the car, and the decoration team, without whom this program would not have been possible. Thank you, dear brothers and fathers. Dear participants, you have been very active and enthusiastic all throughout the lectures, and in fact, your dynamic presence added colors to this program. A big thanks to Brother Cecil for his excellent anchoring of these sessions. Dear friends, the 26th Dharma Endowment Lectures 2021 invites us to think left and think right and think low and think high. The things you can think will be success of life. Once again, I thank dear Professor Sundas, respected faculty members, and my dear friends for making these lectures a successful reality. Thank you. Thank you, brother, for your words of gratitude. Let us now arise for the DVK anthem. I request the DVK choir for the same. Vidyashetra Bhavabhanu Bharate Naisman Vidya Abritam Jayatva Vidyashetra Bhavabhanu Bharate Naisman Vidya Abritam Dharma Shetatva Maksharam Param Rikshitam Esu Deva Sampava Isu Bhakti Parajnanam Basuram Tava Vasana Pashanam Tattu Dasanam Vishesha Chindanam Dhyano Basanam Sopanam Tava Jeevanam Jayatva Vidya Shetra Bhava Bhanu Bharate Naisman Vithya Amritam Sarva Dharma Marga Vetanam Sarva Jana Maitri Sotanam Pavanam Tava Sevanam Punya Tirtha De Vajananu Dhyane Paramadasu Madha Bariya Jayatva Vidya Shetra Bhava Bhanu Bharate Naisman Vithya Amritam Jayatva Vidya Shetra Bhava Bhanu Bharate Once again, thank you all for participating in this endowment lectures. Wishing you a wonderful time philosophizing at the contemporary. This is Chesalizi signing off.